think he wants us to pick up where he left off. You know, saving people, hunting things, the family business. <laughs> So to celebrate one year being on YouTube, I thought of a good idea to redo my Supernatural retrospectives because I want to go back to watch some of those videos and they weren't the best. Hey guys, so with uh, Supernatural airing its final seven episodes, there's a lot of ums in there, a lot of pauses, a lot of edit. I even put images in there. It's not great. I uploaded that video on September 5th. That is my one year anniversary. It's not the day that I joined or made this channel, but it's the day that I uploaded my first video. And I wanted to see if I even learned anything. This is going to be my Supernatural retrospective video and also a way for me to redo things I've done in the past and I will do things differently I think I didn't even do like a typical like retrospective all day is just recap the plot I didn't actually give my thoughts on anything I don't know why I even caught our retrospective I don't know I just did so I won't be doing that I'll just do it differently in this video but let's get started So the general plot for season one of Supernatural is looking for their dad, John. Every now and then he pops up here and there, but the main thing about the first half mainly is looking for dad. John just kind of left Dean. Sam is at Stanford College doing a normal safe thing because he's been in the business of hunting and hunting in the show means hunting supernatural beings, werewolves, vampires, ghouls, ghosts, whatever they want to introduce. They hunt. He wanted to get out of that life. So when he comes back into his college dorm, asking him to come back as a favor and kind of like, I don't really have any friends. You're the only person and family that I know of. And I do like the fact that he's kind of built up as this really great hunter whenever the boys meet other hunters other demons they always mention how john is a great hunter he's always good at his job and we don't really get to see that mainly because jeffrey morgan's busy around this time and he's probably like an expensive actor even back then he wasn't as big now because of negan on walking dead but there's a reason why he wasn't in the series at all he was barely in it very expensive for him to be on the show especially when the show's budget in season one by the way was twenty thousand dollars which isn't a lot i think in the later seasons they get like 30 to 40 million but even that is still very cheap low i kind of commemorate them for even having a first season having to spread all that budget and 22 episodes it's not an easy task the very first case or first supernatural being that the boys hunt that we see on screen is the woman in white after that whole ordeal sam is still set on going to that interview to get a normal safe life he drives off only to find jess killed put them through the ceiling just like his mother did bleeding down and a fire starting which then causes sam to basically be like all right i guess i'll be back in the family the family business they go back it's like a case a girl sees a fire there's old photos of them way back that they didn't get picked up down in the basement and in that process they meet missouri a one-off character that shows up later on but she only shows up in two episodes very memorable she leaves a mark on the show she's just a fun character gonna dean for having these thoughts she's a sidekick giving dean a hard time damn he lost jess he's not going to college no more he's now wheeled into this whole hunting but missouri does leave a mark once sam and dean and missouri think they've all purified the home they're wrong sam starts having vision throughout the first half has a gut feeling like something's gonna happen to this lady fire person starts coming in sam gets like thrown around in the kitchen turns out it's their mom but the mom shows up it's a way for dean to see his mom once again because he remembers her he's the oldest so he remember growing up with her having i don't know grilled cheese with her or not while sam was just a little baby so this is sam's first time meeting his mother and she says that she's sorry which very broad but we'll find out later on again a lot of like world building in this first season you want to keep your audience thinking and interested missouri says she did sacrifice herself to free all the other spirits within our own house because she is their mother after all in the same episode john shows up as well just being like can't see me yet you know it's very again very very cryptic and broad not yet until he's finished or got what he's want so it is very much a mystery as to why he doesn't want to see his sons why is the mom saying no and while that can be not annoying but a bit slow i also get it again jeff d morgan's really busy at the time we'll be just mainly focused on the brothers since the show in this first season is world building there's gonna be quite a bit of filler episodes episodes that don't have to really do the whole looking for dad looking for the demon later on which isn't an issue at first world building it needs to set up its rules hopefully follow through those rules universe mythos that they set up and hopefully they can use later on down the road and they do mostly so you get episodes like wendigo for example little story in with the whole journal stuff and the whole line of you know save people hunting things the family business line which has become infamous plain episode where dean's afraid of planes and whatnot sprinkle of story of demon saying that i killed jess or the little boy in the water or even the bloody mirror episode still a really cool episode sam had a vision of just dying he did nothing about it whatsoever trying to ignore his so-called past but then his past is slowly catching up to him in college so there is story in this first half but 
but mainly world building, setting up little things that will be used later on, and most of them are still good, except for bugs. Bugs isn't as bad as we'll make it out to be, unless it's like the fly, a huge, just Godzilla type fly or whatever. It's really not gonna be scary, so when there's spider crawling on people and it's all crawling out of the bathtub, it looks laughable at times. And also Hookman, Hookman, looking back on it, isn't particularly good anymore. It's alright, Sam trying to move on from Jess, but kind of not with this like religious girl and the Hookman killing these certain people around her, this necklace thing, not really that great. But overall, in this first season, the fillers are there to set up the world, set up the mythos of the show. In the mid-season finale, episode 10, they use it as a way to then confront his sort of issues with the family, being bossed around not only by John, but Dean as well. Once he came back, he's been, you know, telling him what to do and whatnot, wanted to do his own thing, which is why he went away to college, left because he wanted freedom. And once he got back, he would fear that, you know, freedom would be lost. He gets to talk to this, I guess, doctor? Is it a doctor? Sam just kind of lives it all out, off screen, by the way, but it comes back all around when Sam gets possessed by this doctor in this insane asylum who wants to make his patient, you know, well. He experiments on them like a mad scientist and just kind of lets it all out. Doesn't like the way that basically Dean thinks, the way that John thinks, treating them like soldiers that will just obey orders and Sam isn't really that out of. It's the first conflict between the brothers where they're physically hurting each other. Now, this won't be the first time that the brothers have a disagreement on something, whether it's world shattering or not, or something personal to family. They're gonna have an issue and it's not the first time. The show exploit this a lot. It's just so much to a point to where I got used to it at a certain point where it's like, yeah, they're doing this again. Makes sense. Same old stuff. But here, it makes sense. It's the first time in terms of having a disagreement and actually, you know, fighting each other for very different circumstances. Sam is possessed. And then the cliffhanger for the missing finale is with John Colleen and Sam picking up. <laughs> So after that long break, the brother, the dad wants them not to find him, leave him alone, orders them once again. Dean is one that follows orders, always a good little soldier, while Sam, on the other hand, is just like, no, I want to do my own thing, essentially. Dean goes off to meet a scarecrow, meets super sus people in this town that are doing a ritual once a year, sending couples to go die to complete some sort of ritual, while Sam meets a girl named Meg. I remember time being like, why are there so much focus on this Meg character? Like, I don't get it. The one-off character that Sam connects with and gets killed off, like, I don't know where it would go. Turns out she's a demon. The human blood talks to her bastard assuming you know yellow eyes comes like the main sort of villain in this first season she's working for yellow eyes but he doesn't really pop up until the very end brothers to deal with they can get through her and then they can get to yellow eyes himself at first meg comes off as this you know nice girl moving to california to be like an actor i think dean struggling on this case and this episode does show that the brothers do need to be together you know they can't be split apart i mean they can do their own stuff but when it comes to the supernatural stuff and being on cases and working together they need to be there for each other and together work better that way as a team so their dad John comes back again, comes in and out of their lives. He comes in with information that he knows about this gun called the Colt. Samuel Colt built it, kill anything, plus he uses that against a demon, the yellow eyed demon. But even before this episode, in the episode Shadow, they find out about Meg, she's using them as bait so that John can come in. And again, more ambitious of him being a great hunter. And so they think they defeat her, and then they finally meet their dad. And within episode 16 as well, Dean even mentions the fact that he hates kind of this family being split in apart. He wants everything to come back together. Him, Sam, their dad, working alongside with each other, being a family once again, him knocking at Sam door wanting Sam to come back in his life feels lost without them and Jensen Ackles he's really good throughout this whole series at the whole emotional stuff which I'm assuming is because of his background in soap opera stuff that he did in Days of Our Lives and then they split once again because they can be used as bait a couple episodes later he shows up idea to kill a yellow eyed demon and again more family drama stuff Sam not really listening doesn't like the fact that he's being ordered around like little kids like soldiers and we see the first news of this cult on a vampire leader and it's still a really cool effect and John finally has a turnaround and different thoughts of like, okay maybe we should you know maybe stay together as a team they do show how the boys were raised and how their lifestyle wasn't particularly the best. They're just moving from town to town, from hotel to motel, and just lived off of eating cereal and maybe hotel food. While their father just kind of left them all alone and teaches them about, well, Dean at first, about how the world actually is and how it works and how there are supernatural beings hunting, meeting other people, meeting other hunters. John just left his boys all alone, which is not the best way to watch your kids like this, especially putting so much pressure on Dean as a little kid to watch over Sam. Eventually, Sam figures out about the whole demons stuff dean always at a very young age was told what to do to keep watching over sam nothing more and nothing less and it's a lot for a kid to handle to put that high of a pressure on him is not really good i mean it would have an effect on him later on in his adult life come back all around later on where he doesn't want to befriend anybody except for his family and sam on the other hand he went off college and he did other things no more things dean was at a very young age stunned or stinted stunned basically at a very young age he just knew his family essentially he didn't want to create any bonds with anyone else because he was afraid he would get yelled by his father and he needed to protect sam 
am essentially. And this isn't particularly the best way to treat your kids, especially when you're putting that much pressure on your older son. Give him a shotgun and kill anything that comes close to actually getting Sam. Dean freaks out, which makes sense. He, he just came back from playing it on an arcade, gets a shotgun, reloads it. John comes in, shoots, yells at him, be like, why didn't you watch him? The way he raised them, the way they kind of just, in a way, mess with his life, own life, and their lives. And it's not a life that I don't think anyone will want. I also just wanted to mention Bobby, who is a side character who would later on become another father figure for the boys, is one of the many side characters of Supernatural that are really great. They're just kind of there for their brothers. Then the boys finally meet Yellow Eyes. He possesses John, tells most of his plans and ordeal for Sam, other kids like him. In the Nightmare episode, Sam meets another one of these kids that have psychic ability and he can control matter or whatnot, while Sam has visions. Kind of sucks when you compare the two, but Yellow Eyes has plans for these other kids just like him and doesn't reveal too much, doesn't reveal all of it so that the boys have a general idea of what he has planned they just have breadcrumbs of it holy water doesn't work on him because he's no normal demon which also indicates a hierarchy in the demon slash hell world and i do like that normal demons the low tier ones are black eyes yellow eyes strongest demon because he has yellow eyes kind of dictates how powerful they are that they don't tell us they just kind of show us when they exercise meg out of the devil's trap at bobby's place they do mention the fact that there is still a girl within meg like meg is just the demon inside this girl and so this vessel and body did fall out of a window which also means that after they exercise Exercise Meg, she's gonna die. Meg was only keeping her intact. Everything within inside her, all broken, all blood, she caused all blood. While he killed the demon, they also killed the human host. And it brings up an interesting question of being like, the hell do they do? How do they really take care of this? Do they really need to kill the human host as well? There needs to be a way to figure this out. And they don't really figure it out because it's hard, it's complicated, and it's supposed to be. Then that comes back full circle when Yellow Eyes is inside the father and Sam has to get the cult to shoot him. Sam shoots his knee first. He doesn't get the demon out nor kill John. John wakes back up as John. He really begs Sam to kill him and it's this very good and intense moment of what Sam is supposed to do. They want to get rid of the demon for sure but it's John so he can't really shoot him quite yet. Sam can't do it. Yellow Eye gets out. They're in the Impala. John obviously yells at them just go ahead and kill me and then as they're arguing and talking a truck just hits them on the side out of nowhere to end off the first season and to leave it at the cliffhanger. The Winchesters they cannot catch a break. So season one overall is pretty good. A lot of failure, but it was world building, finding dad as the first half or the majority of the season, and then sprinkle of the cult and yellow eyes and how to defeat it, which will carry on in the next season. There's like the same recap for like 20 episodes straight, I think. It's the same like 22 years ago, mom died and dad raised the We're we gonna get a different road so far recap, please. And carry on my world return wasn't done in the finale. It was done in the penultimate episode, which thank God they used in the finale for each of the finales after this. It will become an iconic song for every fan of the show. It establishes the relationship between the brothers see how they also grew up and how they were raised and how horrible it was like i don't think anybody wants to grow up this way but maybe having a trunk full of guns and powders and you know supernatural s memorabilia would be cool but the way they live moving town to town hotel to hotel hell no not the way i want to live the only thing holding this season back is the clear you know budget restraints and those two episodes of hookman and bugs those aren't really that great anymore bugs wasn't as bad as people make it out to be and hookman isn't as good no more as i remember i remember liking it rewatch is like oh no this is this is all right this is kind of boring the Faith episode with Julie Benz was really damn good and still is because of the whole perception of Faith and how Julie Benz had so much faith and wanted to be cured by this pastor who had Reapers raised up by his wife. Whether he knew it or not, she put so much faith into this guy that by the end, she ended up being disappointed and she would eventually die and be never seen again. And Benders as well. Still really good. I don't think quite as good as I remembered their take on the world's dangerous game. Humans hunting humans. Sometimes humans can be more scary than the actual monster and supernatural itself. And then the Ghost Facers was introduced. Hell last episode where it showed that this show can be just as scary and funny at the same time so season one of the show started off pretty damn good The second season is the first season but just a better version of it. It expands more on Sam's powers, expands more on the plans of Yellow Eyes, their other sidekicks. Dean's worry about Sam himself, grieving over the father and meeting other hunters. We didn't get to meet other hunters mainly because of the budget. It just expands more on the first season. The first episode opens up in a pretty huge way. John dies. He sacrificed himself for Dean. And so because of that, a reaper wants to go around this hospital taking people and reaping them because they're dead. They didn't accept that they are dead and if they can't move on, they'll turn into angry spirits. And that's how this 
Reaper named Tessa tells Dean like, hey, you need to move on or else you're going to become what you hunt, which I think is a really cool mythos to introduce the lore to add on. Throughout the show, they just keep adding on these mythos or just how things are. And John, they're, you know, they're fighting, they're butting heads. It seems like they never get along because the last time he does see him or talk to him is butting heads with them and he sees them drop. Well, not drop, but he sees them on the ground dead. John summons Yellow Eyes so that he can make a deal to sacrifice his life for Dean's life because he's not waking up. Yellow Eyes is being very cryptic. Person that he's possessing will be the permanent actor that will play Yellow Eyes and this actor plays him pretty damn well. He has a smug smile and charisma to be sneaky, to be evil. John also knows all about Sam and the other kids, how they're sidekicks, but he loves keeping secrets from his sons. And obviously the boys grieve over his death. Throughout this first half, they meet other hunters and they talk about how their dad never mentioned them and other hunters and other lore, like very knowledgeable things that could help the boys, but they have to find out on their own. John told him a secret and he needs to keep that secret, eating him up inside as well. And it's also ballsy on the show's part to kill off John. The whole first season, most of it was looking for dad and then only to find out that he will die permanently in the beginning, the first episode of season two. The other sidekicks. So I think we only meet five other sidekicks, I believe, not including the first season sidekick. I think we only meet five other sidekicks within this season. Andy, who's my favorite. I think everyone's favorite. He's just that nice guy who knows that he has these powers, only using them for everyday lives, not, you know, taking over the world or whatnot. Ava, who has that quirky personality, a bit dorky, but you love her until the very end. One who gets killed by a certain hunter in episode 10, and then the other two you meet during the two-part finale. Personally, would have won more, but I guess the show has already shown us what the other psychic can do. And it is funny that Sam's the only has visions while the other ones, they have like, you know, very powerful or they can control demons or talk a way out of a situation. But the whole point of meeting these psychics is to, you know, later on, see them later down the road of the two-part finale. Ava's the one that gets taken away by demons and you don't really know what happens to her until she comes back around. And those are the only two psychics. There are other psychics mentioned during the two-part finale, but we don't get to see them because budget. Gordon Walker is the only hunter, human villain, that's scary and an actual threat to the brothers because he's introduced to create that gray area within the show. The job of the boys hunting not all the supernatural beings or monsters are evil. Gordon is hunting these vampires and it turns out he's going after them for essentially no reason by the fact that they're vampires and they're monsters. So he has this very black and white sort of perspective and view on the world and the boys have to figure out was this even a good thing or not. And by the end it's not because these vampires they're just kind of you know living life going by eating cow blood or cows you know organs not trying to kill human beings and they're actually doing something good. Gordon doesn't care from his views they're evil and they will always be evil. It really brings an interesting perspective because because they meet Joe, Ellen, and Ash, and they seem very nice. They know John. They find out that John is dead, but they seem like very nice people. They own a bar one not your roadhouse. But then the next episode, they meet Gordon, and they think, okay, this is a nice hunter. No, he is, I guess, a good hunter, a very scary one, but his views and the way he works and the way he hunts, it's dangerous and other hunters kill. And since John died, Dean sees Gordon as sort of a replacement for the father figure, and Sam immediately notices. But by the end, is like, okay, yeah, Gordon's not really a good person. He's a really good hunter, but, you know, he's very dangerous. Crossroads Blues is probably the most essential Supernatural episode. If you want to get anyone interested in watching Supernatural, I think this is the episode that deals with demons, hell, and just how deals are made to work. The most essential thing in this world, in this universe, and they dedicate an entire episode to it. So they take history, like real history, or I guess, yeah, I guess history from this guy whose name I forgot about, but this guy essentially was really good at playing guitar, and there's rumors that he made a deal with the devil during a crossroads kind of area, and we see that where it's in the middle, and there's like four roads, and then use that as a way to establish more lore establish how probably John made that same deal. The hellhounds as well are really damn scary. Not only are they big, they are invisible, so you can't see them. It seems really OP by the way. I would not want to make a deal knowing that 10 years later down the line, I will be killed by a goddamn hellhound. Most of those people don't even know that there's a hellhound coming out of them, but they're greedy, they're impulsive, and they want to make a deal to be out on a rich or save a person and whatnot. So there's one lady, she wanted to get rich or something like that, and because of that 10 years later, she's all freaking out, seeing faces, all disheveled and whatnot, and then a hellhound comes through the window and grabs her. There's one guy who wanted to be a great artist, just accepts what he's done and is like, yep, I'm just waiting and just accepts that he made the wrong decision and wanted to be something much more bigger and much more meaningful. And then the last guy, he sacrificed his own soul and life to save his wife. He just given cancer, which goes back to John. Dean does believe that John did trade his life for Dean and again, Dean has a different reaction to it. Each person who's making these deals or learns the fact that that person made a deal for them has a very different reaction. Dean's reaction is like, well, I guess I gotta get that back, but he was willing to accept death. But then John made that deal learning the fact that most probably John did this to save his life he doesn't feel that it's worth it at all he feels that there's a burden on him because of the fact that he was willing to accept death and not be afraid of it and Dean was totally ready to make that deal with that crossroads demon when Sam questions him near the end of the episode being like you weren't seriously gonna take that deal right it was all silent he's gonna take that deal 
And then in the next episode, the show uses history once again, Crotoan. So the brief history of Crotoan, because I'm really into like unsolved mysteries and Crotoan is one of those mysteries. Essentially a group of people on this island, very large group, they vanished and the last thing that they wrote was Crotoan and most people don't know how they even disappeared. They're not in the water or whatnot or even on the island itself. Supernatural takes that history and has their own spin on it. And so when Sam and they visit a town that has carved in Crotoan in it, all the phone lines are dead, people are going crazy, blood transferring, which makes them very erratic, erratic. There's a Mr. Rogers joke and the reason they even go there is because Sam has a vision of Dean killing this kid who is infected and that almost happens where Dean's about to kill this kid. This kid comes in all blooded up on the leg. The doctor checked infected and by then he's not but Dean was willing to kill a kid for essentially no context or no evidence whatsoever and this isn't the first again nightmare in season one and then I think earlier this season but Dean is just this way. Shoot first and ask questions later that's all he's really known and then just like the actual history itself whenever all the remaining survivors they go out town is silent. Everyone is gone just like crow towing using actual history and having their own take on it and then speaking of their own take their own take is the fact that this is done by a demon so that young boy is just like meg was well, not meg but he talks the whole cup and blood thing and says that this is a test for sam and sam was infected but he's fine by the doctor and turns out sam is immune to this so more plans of yellow eyes looming over the second season despite only showing up for like three episodes i think something like that very limited amount of episodes but his plans and his ordeal is still looming throughout the second season and then because this is the mid-season finale they leave off the cliffhanger as Dean about to tell John's secret having to wait like a month or something like that two months After its long mid-season break, they come back with the episode Hunted, and guess who comes back? Gordon. He learns of the demon's plans and yellow eyes plans, and learns that these psychics are, to him, monsters. Turns out he knows one of these monsters, and it's Sam. It's a good way to bring him back, and a good way to have motivation because of payback for what they did to him in episode 3. While on the flip side, Ava gets introduced. Again, very nice, very quirky type of character. Dean freaking out. He doesn't want him to go anywhere. Oh yeah, and I forgot. The secret was that Dean might have to kill Sam. It's a very big reveal and moment, and big secret to lay on your older son and then just go away without any consequences well i guess there is which is hell but on earth he's not there to explain it dean and sam they just kind of have to figure it out do i kill you he's throughout the second half of the season there's benches of sam getting drunk and saying that you have to kill me he can't control it there's an entire episode where you think sam is going to evil but meg is actually possessing him looming faith of dean might actually have to kill his brother even though he doesn't want to even then warns sam about the vision that she had of him dying comes back around to help save him and defeat gordon and get him arrested going to prison which again will come back all around in season three and then Ava goes missing. Turns out there's sulfur, which means demons took her. It leaves off there as it would come back later on in a two-part finale. And then the FBI catches up to the boys. Now this is a continuation, or maybe it is, but they mentioned Skin, season one. A new character is also introduced, Hendrickson, who will become an annoyance to the brother, but also you get why he's doing what he's doing. He doesn't fully understand the supernatural world, so he's just doing what he thinks is a good job. And it also has Ronald, by only showing up for an episode or two. He's very memorable of the laser eye stuff. And the episode itself, Night Shifter, is a cat and mouse episode within this bank of the shapeshifter shifting its skin, while Sam and Dean have to go around the bank, figuring out which one's the real one so it's really self-contained and most of the time whenever it's self-contained it's usually a pretty good episode there's a cat and mouse situation in the bank while cops news outlet and fbi are outside giving enough time so they can just break in there gives roughly the right amount of time for the boys to catch this shapeshifter the episode also ends in renegade really good way to end off this episode then hendrickson comes back in episode 19 the prison episode where the boys go to prison the reason they even go to prison is for a hunt which i think is ridiculous like even sounds like this is the stupidest idea ever get caught and get rid of a ghost but how can you do that without any song why not there is salt in the prison and sam maneuvers his way throughout the prison there's different levels and the ghost got out but it's like that's i don't know but it's, it's still a fun episode and how dean just fits right into it but the lord defending sam and dean having a hard time with hendrickson hendrickson is so set on these two boys just being criminals this lord realizes they going to the wrong grave burning up the bone though obviously he's gonna have to come back at some point but the boys once again they get away from the fbi while hendrickson and his team are just dumbfounded by the fact that they got away Houses of the Holy is, I think, the first time they bring up religion or dedicate an entire episode about religion and how this whole time Sam was the one praying God and angels and hopefully there's a good side to all this darkness that the boys are hunting. And by this point in the show, all we've seen is darkness and monsters. Any light of like angels or God whatsoever, there's a kind of philosophy battle. Okay, maybe not philosophy battle, but Sam's the one that believes in this case of people being told by angels to kill bad people while Dean's like, no, that's just a vengeful spirit. And Dean's a skeptic. He doesn't believe in angels. There's lore about angels, but none of the boys have seen one yet. 
So Sam gets pulled by an angel of this white light being like, kill this bad person. And that's when they have the conversation being like, you know, Dean brings up the fact that he possibly needs to kill Sam. And then Sam believes in his holy kind of mission being like, it's God's will. And then Dean also mentions the fact that his mom would always say that angels are watching over them. From his view and from his perspective, complete lie because their mom died by a demon. And so it brings up an interesting kind of question, which I do like whenever I show questions both sides and find somewhat of a middle ground. And then by the end, it turns out it is just vengeful spirit. So when he lets go, there's a final destination as kill who went through his mouth. And so by the end of the episode, the boys start off with Sam believing and Dean being a skeptic. By the end, they both kind of flip sides. Not completely, but you could definitely tell that Sam was disappointed by not being an angel while Dean is just like, okay, maybe I'll start to believe this. Believing and having faith and that angels are there. This world isn't all just kind of darkness and monsters. And so it's just interesting that they start off that way and by the end, it flips. Not completely, just a little bit. So we get like a filler bunch from episodes 15 through 19. I guess 20, but I'm not like gonna count that. But this is the filler bunch. Now, I don't personally mind this because probably the most memorable and some of the best filler of the show's history in this season. So we got Tall Tales, introduction of Trickster, who later become very important later on, but a very fun episode. Slow dance. Lady in red. The lady in red and alien stuff, crocodile stuff, the brothers banter, fighting with each other, being on the road. All of it's hilarious. Still hilarious. 16. It doesn't hold up as much. It's still a good episode, but once you know the twist, it's more like, okay, yeah, I just want to get to that twist and not have to watch the whole episode. There's clearly signs of it, of Sam saying it and what the brothers are saying. I just kind of want to get to the end. And also picks up an interesting question of where do people go? Where do ghosts and demons go whenever the boys burn the bones of a person? Where do they go? And the boys, they just don't know. They just do their job. They don't really think about that whatsoever. Episode 17, the hardly good episode that will make anyone cry. What's a girl's name, Madison? Sam falls for her and by the end, he has to kill her because they can't reverse this wolf bite on her. And it's also marrying what he might have to do to Sam by the end of the season. Might have to kill him. And then the Hollywood episode, it's also a lot of fun as well. Higher ups and exec making bad decisions on set and making the film not so great. That's like a real thing in Hollywood. Poke fun at it. Episode 20 is one of the two, I think, episodes that Eric Kripke himself directed. And this is a great episode. It's basically an episode about how life ain't fair and just how much sacrifice that the boys in the Winchester have to give to just the world in general. Dean meets a Dejan? I don't know how to say it, but it traps the human in its own reality of great memories. Both Dean and Sam, they have a normal life. Jess is back. She's all alive. Their mother's back, but John dies. Good balance. But he has a wife of his own, but he goes back, gets breakfast made, reminding him of how life was like when he was a little kid. But then reality sinks in he sees this girl who's like a ghost apparition he asks us questions about things in this world and he realizes all the cases that him and his brother saw the people that they saved they're all dead and he soon realizes that why and he goes to his father's grave basically cries in the message being like how come they have to sacrifice everything to save the world why do they have to be heroes why do they have to be the ones who have to sacrifice everything while everyone else gets to live their normal happy life and then by the end he ultimately has to choose what's right which is sacrifice kills himself within that world wakes back up sam finds him it was a very nice world he could have lived in it and just died. He could have just let himself go, lived in that world, but he didn't do that. It would have been selfish of him to be like, no, this world's great. I want to live in here. Through reality, I like this world. But he can't do that. He needs to save people. He needs to be there for his brother. Whenever they kill the yellow eyed demon, he has to, again, sacrifice his happiness for the rest of the world, essentially. And he questions whether it's even worth it or not. And the whole world, they don't know what they do or most hunters do. So it's like, well, I don't think it's quite worth it. The two part finale brings out the yellow eyes plans for all the psychics. Turns out he doesn't need soldier he needs one soldier and so in the first part we have dean and bobby who bobby by the way helping out the boys in the season we have tall tales getting ingredients for the boys he's a very large help for the boys they're searching for sam they go to the roadhouse turns out ash dies off screen while they assume ellen is dead but sam is dealing with other psychics ava and andy come back they meet two new other psychics and turns out eva just turned evil she's been gone for like five months and she tends that she just left and saw sam those months ago and turns out she likes this pot she likes controlling demons with her mind and whatnot good like one from her quirky just nice aura about her and then find out later on that she enjoys this power that she's using and tell sam that you know if you just use it learn how to use it you wouldn't mind it again teasing the fact that he might actually have to kill him everyone just kills each other she kills andy that one girl that touches people with yellow eyes and then jake kills sam dean and barbara just go right in the nick of time to see sam get killed and sam is actually dead there's no way getting around this but there is one way one loophole for dean he makes a deal crossroads again that essential episode comes back all around in the finale and will be a catalyst to 
the, the whole plot of season 3 where Dean makes a deal. He has one year to live. He kisses her to make that deal. But Sam's back. He's alive. Bobby, obviously, pissed off, yells at him. But again, Dean brings back the whole how John sacrificed himself for him and claims that he isn't even supposed to be here. He's willing to accept death to him. His life is worthless. Might as well give his life to his own brother, which is a selfish act on him. Now Sam has to figure that out. Burden to be like, okay, now I gotta see my brother in the next season. Ella comes back. And then Yellow Eye News is Jake to use the cult. The cult is a key to open the gates of hell. It's also a way for him to get inside. And then they get to Jake. Jake does some psychic shenanigans stuff. And Sam kills him brutally. He just keeps shooting him and shooting him. And then Yellow Eyes shows back up. Mitch the fact that Sam isn't 100% pure Sam. The way that he killed Jake. And it turns out he was his favorite. He needs Sam. That one little soldier is indeed Sam. And there's a one bullet, by the way, in the cult. And he's about to shoot Dean. But then Dad comes back. John comes back in a ghost form. Gets like the black smoke. And it's enough for Dean to get the gun and shoot the one last bullet. Bullet. boom it's a really damn cool like bullet shot it kills yellow eyes it's a great moment like this whole time they needed the cult and there's one bullet left so they were seeing that moment for this episode and yellow eyes has been looming throughout the first two seasons so killing him in the season two finale it felt worth the journey of dealing with john and the yellow eyes and the Colts felt like it was worth it waiting for that one bullet to just be new plan are still in progress ellen and bobby close the gates of hell bunch of demons are out now and they later find out that end of yellow eyes is here but his plans are still going on behind the scenes with other help and then to end off the season a call back to the pilot episode of they got work to do so season 2 overall is really good. Like I said earlier, it's essentially season 1 but a better version of it. Expanding more on the lore and mythos and the whole universe of Supernatural. And a way that makes sense, it isn't just kind of going out of left field. It just makes sense overall. Better filler episode. It has more story to it. Demons, demon deals, crossroads. I think that's to me when I think of Supernatural. It's demons. John dying in the beginning was a huge shocker. Yellow eyes. The sprite only showed off for I think yeah 3 episodes. Really good villain. Introducing other hunters into it like Gordon, Ellen, Joe, and Ash. While also again having another funny episode with tall tales showing the fact that they can have serious dark moments be a funny show as well so yeah season two is a step up for the show So the whole plot for season 3 revolves around saving Dean from hell, preventing him to go to hell. But in the majority of the first half, Dean is just kind of like, eh, whatever. He's just kind of giving up. He's willing to accept it, just like he accepts death. And throughout the first, I guess, 9 episodes, he's progressively getting worried. Like, at first he's like, yeah, whatever, man. Sam, don't save me. Let me have fun for this one year. And, you know, Sam's getting frustrated with Dean. Like, do you not care? And he clearly does not care whatsoever. But at a certain point, he's just like, yeah, okay. Maybe going to hell wasn't the ideal death for me. He's willing to accept death in the hospital. But in this case all bloodied up by hellhounds isn't the most ideal way to go and especially going down to hell take sam to talk to him for a while you know there's moments in like episode seven maybe just drop the act be a brother or why not but it's not until he talks to himself until he realizes yeah he should probably get out and find a way to get out of this whole deal Ruby is an important player in this season and next season as well. Played by Katie Cassidy, the first actress to play her. Throughout this season, she's mainly connected to Sam. She actually doesn't meet Dean until the ninth episode. Plans for Sam for him, but also she could find a way to get Dean out of his deal. Just throughout the first half, teasing Sam, showing that she is a demon, but a different type of demon. But eventually, she saved the boys' lives as well. Sam even uses the cult on her at one point, even Bobby, but she is willing to help Bobby fix the cult and how to make bullets for the cult now that they have it. And most of it is cryptic stuff. She first tells Sam about his mom. Every person that she knew, they all get killed. They all died, in part because of Yellow Eyes and his plans. But it almost seems too cryptic to a point to where it seems like Eric Kripke and the Reds didn't know what to do with her. Like, I don't know if they didn't know what to do with her or they just planned for her to pop out every now and then so that she could aid Sam without Dean knowing because Sam doesn't tell him until the ninth episode. And whenever she does meet him, he almost kills her with a cult but then saves him from these witches. And within episode 9, it is revealed that she was once human and all demons were. They were all once human but they all go down to hell and their humanity is stripped away. And so in the end scene, Ruby's telling Dean all about this and Fred up says there's no saving him from going to hell he's gonna go in there and it's gonna happen to him his humanity is gonna get stripped away and he's gonna become a demon essentially and I think that's a really cool again lore building of how hell works in this show Ruby it does reveal that she still remembers humanity she doesn't know why but she just does which is why she's not as evil or wants to possess human beings and create chaos and lie and she also has that really cool knife which by the way the boys do still not only in this season but in the future seasons it's a really cool looking knife it's got engravings in it it can kill demons they don't only have to just use a cult they have this knife now and she's also trying to get sam ready for an upcoming war because he's gonna need to move on without him he's gonna be in hell but sam's still gonna be up here fighting the war and ruby's gonna be there along his side lisa isn't necessarily important in this season but she will be 
in season 5 but just mention her hair because of her and Ben clearly resembles Dean but it's not his actual son which you do find funny it looks like him he dresses the way he likes rock and roll you know all that stuff but it's actually not his son but she's basically just here as a way to Dean to catch up with life this whole season Dean's trying to find the best way to live his life until time is over for him rekindle with Lisa and me his not son which is totally the son but it's not and it's also because he probably sees Lisa as a partner more than just another girl another character that's also introduced is Bella now I see her as more as like a catwoman as character she's not literally a catwoman but she does take things sells them for money and that's kind of how I imagine catwoman as well she's just a person that the boys run across on this rabbit's foot she steals it for them needs good luck Bobby even knows her because you know Bobby just knows everyone Bella isn't necessarily a hunter she knows how hunters work but I'm like a cat burglar you know just stealing stuff making money for herself all she cares about is herself and that comes back to bite her in the ass so six the water ghost one the ship thing but she steals the hand sells it for money but she sees this boat and finds out that this ship is specific people that have shed blood of their own family so she clearly did something to her family and she either killed them or found someone to kill them because selfish selfish is what i get from her being completely selfish the boys well mainly dean because in this episode he had a dance with her and there's a fake out their banter with each other is really good really funny while sam's dealing with the old lady who all over him by the way but he just wants to shoot her but the boys they save people so they gotta save her and the water effect is still really cool she gives half the money to them but then after this episode every now and then she just really sus things gives the location to gordon for the boys because gordon's still set on killing sam with the psychic stuff she calls the fbi on the boys while looking for for the cult she steals the cult you don't see the cult until season five and then the one opportunity that dean has that confront her he confronts her finds like this uh plant thing i don't know what's it called on the top of her door and figures out that she too just like dean made a deal 10 years ago this demon knew that she was being assaulted by her family and that she made a deal not knowing that she was being used by this demon and using the vulnerability of bella to kill her family she didn't realize that she would die 10 years later and so throughout the season when you look back the rabbits for, for good luck the cult so that she could defend it from hellhounds like these little things now make sense if she would have just asked for help the boys would have helped her but based off of what happens in the finale gonna help her in any way she dies off screen if it's a black with a very loud hellhound growl killing her so she is an interesting character that just pops up every now and then that only cares about herself but by the end needs help and she would have asked help by bobby the boys or anyone else and stopped kind of being this cat burglar kind of character they would have helped her but because of that there's consequences she dies for it and guess who comes back gordon but this time for the last time we see him in episode three talking to other hunters on hunting sam that hunter comes back because he got beat by bat i'm batman man they meet each other they shoot each other but this vampire turns gordon into a vampire because he killed his family opportunity to get his revenge but in doing so he's gonna use his new powers to his advantage eats a person he goes to his friend's trailer but also kills him by this point he's a straight up villain there's no gray area one last thing he wants to do is obviously kill sam he says he's gonna kill himself after he kills sam but i don't know man i think he likes he likes being a vampire he couldn't help himself but i do like this the fact that in order to get rid of gordon they had to turn him into a vampire in order to be like okay yeah i guess we just gotta kill this guy he keeps coming back and back and every time they think they get rid of him he always keeps coming back for more and so he's not gonna stop until they get rid of him permanently and they do in this episode it's a really cool and bloody kill i wish they would have not cut from it but i'm assuming that's his network kind of feeling no you can't show all that blood and within this episode sam does confront dean and accuse dean sort of arc of its ticking time bomb just drop the act i know you're scared it does get through the dean to a point but it does get enough to a point where he's like yeah all right gordon the only human villain and character that they had to turn to your vampire owner to get rid of is a really good villain because it's a contrast to the boys there's always good and bad gordon's sort of views on it it's completely different which is what makes him good and dangerous he's still set on killing sam strictly because he sees everything as black and white and so in order to get rid of him permanently they just gotta get rid of him and again the only very only human villain that worked because they tried doing a season 12 with goddamn british men of letters but i'll get to that whenever i get to season 12 so the mid-season finale is a christmas centric episode it's a nice way to end off the first half which again written during the writer strike so i don't know if this was meant to be the end it seems like nine was meant to be dean's gonna go to hell no matter what and you gotta move on from that but episode 8 ends off in a nice way the boys celebrating dean's last christmas you know everything's about dean's last stuff in the season So episode 10 is the episode that finally Dean accepts the fact that he is scared. He needs to get out of this deal. And it's also the show's take on A Nightmare on Elm Street. Which is funny because they have Robert Engel himself in season 6 later on. But I just think it's funny that they couldn't quite get him in this episode. I just wish they did. So it takes Dean to go within his own head. Have a dream about himself. And talk to himself about how he feels about himself. And talk about how nothing's original about him. His dad. His car. He never had a mind of his own. He's always a good little soldier. Did what dad told him. Protect Sam. That's essentially it. Putting a lot of pressure and burden on Dean as a young kid. He's had enough. If I 
surprised himself and saw all the crap that he put on him was a lot as a kid. All he knew growing up, he was always there, leaving them in motels during Christmas or whatnot when he goes out hunting or, you know, starting a new family. He was never there for the boys. He just kind of left them alone, unwatched, had to teach them about the hunting life, ruin their childhoods in a way. We also get to find out more about Bobby, so why he became a hunter. He killed his wife not knowing the fact that a demon possessed her, so he just killed her with a shotgun. He would regret killing his wife. He didn't know what he needs to know. This is also one of the few images of Sam's psychic powers. His powers doesn't really get brought up in the season because mainly being his taking time bomb of going to hell, but this is like the only mention I think using it against who's basically just a little budget version of Freddy Krueger. And then by the end, Dean just tells Sam he needs help. He needs to find a way out of this deal. And Sam's like, okay, yes, finally, let's do this together as a team. Now, I originally wasn't going to talk about Mystery Spot, but then I thought, no, you know what? I'm just going to talk about Mystery Spot. Even though it has nothing to do with plot, it is essentially a filler episode, but man, it's a great episode. It's their take on Groundhog Day or just the time loop genre and general. Trickster is back, obviously he's behind it, and the joke is on Sam on how he can't save Dean, seeing him die over and over again. He can't help his brother at all. And it seems like the trickster is trying to teach Sam a lesson, which brings up the question, why? Why does he care so much about these two brothers and trying to teach Sam a lesson? And you know, we find out why later on, but at this moment, it's like, okay, why do you care so much? He can also push it up, Trickster, creating chaos, having fun. He can also take it that way as well, but it makes sense when, you know, you find out who he really is. Seeing all the ways that Dean died and waking up the heat of the moment, I will always remember it from the show and it also serves as a way to Sam to possibly accept that there's no way of saving even though he's gonna keep trying to help save Dean there's a chance a high chance that it can't be stopped and then another character that shows up is Hendrickson and the FBI so they actually capture the boys because of Bella Bella's dirty deeds and whatnot and in this episode I do like the fact that they do treat the boys like criminals Sam steals the cross from the virgin girl and the way they come in and all the chains and whatnot from the perspective of the station they're criminals they're evil I do like that they betray the boys like that there's a supernatural twist to it because this is the work of demons there's not there's a demon inside him as well i don't know if they're trying to say that there's a demon in him all along in season two but i'm assuming it was in him in this season it could make sense but i don't know it just makes more sense that it happens in this season in this episode before off screen and then the demons have plans for sam and dean that line from dean about shooting the deputy is still hilarious and so everyone in the police station remaining they get ready for war the demon war all those black smokes are coming out but the ruby comes in claims that she needs a cold cold has been taken by bella and then she needs a virgin that one girl who's a virgin wants them to use a sacrifice but they're not willing to kill a human so ruby just leaves the demons just let her go demons start coming out they start shooting them with rock salt and they all plan to get them inside this whole police station they can do the whole exorcism verse and the boys think that they've won they do believe that they saved people events hendrickson's the let them go does not have the fbi after them over and over again but then lilith shows up kills everyone in the police station ruby comes back in the hotel room saying that yeah all the people that they saved that they think they saved they all die because of the heroic act so just as the boys think they have a win turns out it's not you take another l and ruby just says they'll do things her way next time because more efficient so dean's time is up still trying to find a way out but by the end just accepts it he was willing to accept it by the beginning and near the end and middle is like you know what? maybe we can prevent this but there's no way around this at all he made that deal no matter what the first thing they do is deny from ruby because they don't trust her like she knew about lilith and the deal that lilith holds on dean and they have a fight they take that knife she's stuck in a devil's trap while that's going on lilith as a little girl who by the little girl this actress playing lilith does a fantastic job Lilith being inside this little girl reminds me of the omen where you know this is cute little boy cute little girl that shouldn't be evil but they are and that's what Lilith is scaring this family away killing the grandfather and whatnot all that super creepy they're on the road Dean finds that there's a demon within this policeman so he starts seeing like real faces behind the human host as well and all the face distorted stuff that we saw in Crossroads Blues that comes back around as well again that episode essential to this season boys they saying one I dead or alive as one last song is saying they're in this nice little suburban neighborhood Sam almost kills a little girl but but turns out she's not inside Lilith no more. Ruby gets out somehow. Turns out Lilith got Ruby out. Possessing Ruby, the very last moment, Sam tries to convince Ruby, hey, what else do we do? But about to be midnight, Dean just accepts it. And Sam has to as well. He has to accept it and move on and just keep on fighting whatever wars gonna come up. And the hellhounds start appearing. Lilith traps both the boys, allows the door to be open, and rips Dean apart. And I think this is probably the most bloodiest the show's ever gotten. At least shown on screen. I feel like that Gordon one probably could have been really bloody and cool. But on screen wise, bloody is him getting ripped apart, his torso getting ripped apart, agony all in his face one eye white flash it does nothing at all ruby tries to stop as well but then she gets out both her and dean are lying on the floor going to a shot into his eyes seeing hell which looks really cool hooks and chains to his body screaming for help for sam and that's how this third season ends with dean being in hell 
season 3 overall while being 6 episodes short with 16 episodes because of writer strike is still a really damn good season. The whole season is basically a ticking tire bomb for Dean and his inevitable doom and fate of going to hell getting ripped to shreds by hellhounds and along the ride we meet new characters, these new characters they die out, we meet old characters they come back and they get rid of so Gordon, Hendrickson's the FBI in general, new characters, Ruby, Bella, we get rid of them, Ruby not so much but Bella obviously, Lisa, she and Ben are a glimpse of hope for Dean as someone who he sees more than just another girl, he sees her as a partner and maybe family with. We don't get much of Sam's psychic powers, the only mention of it is in episode 10 but he's there to basically yell at Dean be like hey you need help, frustrated with the fact that he doesn't care about his own demise and the majority of the first half, turnaround point, both of them having to accept the fact that Dean going to hell is going to happen no matter what, hard to swallow that, hard to be like no it's not, we're going to change it somehow but by the end they can't, it's inevitable. Third season of the show is still really damn good. So season 4 to me always competes with like one of the best seasons ever and that's mainly because of the premiere. Okay maybe not but the way the season opens up is probably the best opener of the show's history. They start their introduction of angels. There was talk about maybe there might not be angels but turns out there are. There very much are angels and they burn people's eyes. Demons are scared of them or demons that they don't know that they exist. They are scared of them. Ruby scared of them. Ruby comes back. So Dean gets out. Dean is out of hell for some reason. We don't find out why. He's trying to convince Bobby and Sam. He is there. Him and Bobby think Sam made a deal but he didn't. He was running for like four or five months he's gonna do anything about it so he's adopting Dean's personality trait getting with girls but not texting them back calling them back whatsoever he drove the car he has an ipod in there and whatnot which is also funny because this is like 2008 2009 and this show started with like the flip phones as the show went on they just progressed the smartphones sometimes i forget they started with flip phones and like myspace and whatnot so it was funny going back and watching the earlier seasons sam claims he's been doing nothing but that's a complete lie when we go to the diner turns out he's been using his powers he's been working with ruby and new different actors which is his wife and he doesn't want to tell dean about his powers yet because he thinks it's bad and Sam thinks he's doing good with Ruby taking out demon out of human bodies or whatnot and then we see this person in a trench coat walking along demon knife don't work bullets don't work salt don't work burned out Pamela's eyes he reveals he's the angel of the lord he shows his wings for the first time claims that he did it because God commanded it and they have work for him and then that's how the premiere ends off and I think it is the most perfect way to come back from the finale of season 3 to reveal that angels are indeed real and they've come back after being gone for like 2000 years so the most notable angel on the show is Castiel obviously he's the one that's obviously focused on because he's gonna be sticking around for the majority of the show and he's an angel that has doubts throughout the season he's the one that questions his orders and missions whether if it's even worth it or not whether it's even good or bad he doesn't know and he tells us the dean later on just being like I don't know whether this is right or wrong he's lost touch with that and he seemingly is the only angel that seemingly that cares about humanity Yorio another angel who's just a dick you know this is the first of the, the dick jokes where angels are too righteous to a point to where they're just big old dicks when he's first seen in episode 7 sam even mentions the fact that yeah you guys are that's right you're supposed to be sympathetic or you know what the bible says but no nope. their purification is blown up a town to prevent one of the 66 seals from being broken by lilith he doesn't want to follow orders but castell tells him they need to follow orders and he's the one that all wants to rebel and then zachariah he's another angel that likes following orders because he likes the plan most of them are dicks the general thing about angels they are dicks so this new ruby has a new and different relationship with sam in a flashback in episode 9 we find out that he's in different body in order to convince sam she starts casino and they have sex and it's a very different type of relationship from season three from season three it was very much an ally it helped very distant at first but eventually as season three went on he would trust her in a way this season it's very much intimate and she somehow convinces her to drink the demon blood at this point of the story you could trust her because she was very trustworthy in season three helped save dean we trust the demon and you can still trust her because she is trustworthy at this point and then sam's new powers are essentially what the others are but in a different way so they probably start off little like sam's visions right but in this one and this new upgraded version of his powers he can get demons out of the human host instead of killing both the demon and the human right this is seen as good and it is good it's good for sam to get the demons out but it's also hurting sam like in episode 7 sam has to get sam Hain out of this body and he's struggling he doesn't have enough juice but his nose starts bleeding out his head starts hurting but he gets it out it seems like while he's helping people he's hurting on the inside as well which is why dean has an issue with it but not also that is because getting demons out 
with your mind and that's not really natural and out of all of the powers Sam is the one that seems pure and good because we have the one gift from Nightmare News as Magneto, Jake very powerful, Ava controlling demons just like Sam but in a different way, Andy is talking to people with mind control, he wasn't doing it for bad but his evil brother was doing it for bad as well so it seems like Sam's version of his power seemingly so far is for good, he's getting demons out of humans, hope saving not killing the human. This season also sets up a lot of things that would go on in season 5 for example the tease of the apocalypse or horsemen, how Lilith is going around and breaking specific 66 seals so that she can free Lucifer, the second mention of Lucifer, first mention was in season 3 as well, getting you ready for the rise of Lucifer, doing a lot of things that would make season 5 good. And then a girl named Anna who's in a same war thing claims that she knows about Lilith, the seals and how she can arrest Lucifer and this attracts demons obviously and angels as well. She says that she can hear angel radio and so within this two episodes I guess this is kind of like a two-parter in a way there's like a to be continue which there's a lot of like to be continues in this season there's one at the end of the back to the future episode war for information on each side once Cass and Euro get there you think you know they would want to help him but turns out they're here to get rid of her and kill her as the season goes on these angels are just more and more villainous and evil in a way and I gets rid of them but this hand central thing which by the way this hand angel get rid of angel thing the hand blood central thing will be used multiple times throughout the season mainly because it's a way to get rid of angels and it's probably not that expensive in terms of visual effect like you just have red ink whatever on there and you just tap it there's a white light i mean i'm assuming it's not expensive they use it multiple times and it would just be one of the boys arsenal if there's a bunch of angels opportunity to just get your own blood and make that single and tap your hand on it and then they have pamela come back with her white eyes making her look like lilith turns out anna is indeed an angel she disobeyed fall from grace or fall from heaven but grace somewhere else on a tree or somewhere and so while they're looking for that booby is still trying to convince sam drink more demon blood because at the first half he's like no i'm listening to my brother but near the end of this whole first half thing he's like okay you know what i guess i'll do it doing his own demon stuff and then yurio comes back with anna's grace and then in a really cool moment we have both angels and demons fighting each other and i think this is the one time i'm trying to think maybe not but like this is the one memorable time that i remember angels and demons fighting each other and within all this chaos the boys just kind of get thrown around whenever the boys are kind of the supporting character in the show you would think it'd be an issue but it's not it's actually really cool because we see so much of them that sometimes we may need a break from them and i guess they're grace back the angels go away the demons go away and he finally tells sam like throughout this whole first half he's been having nightmares going on sam clearly knows sam told his story about ruby now dean's turn and again jensen always doing the really good emotional stuff he's always really good at that he tortured souls in hell and how alistair tortured him and how he became the torturer and how much he hated it it's a really good scene showing vulnerability on dean's part <laughs> So after the break, we get to the siren episode. Turns into the boys venting out each other how they truly feel about each other's circumstances where Dean doesn't like the fact that Sam lies about the little stuff. He doesn't care that he has demon blood or he's with Ruby, but the little things like lying and finding out that he is still lying to him at this point, doesn't like that. Sam on the other hand, he couldn't care less about Dean's adventures in hell, how much stronger he is. He doesn't see Dean as being fit or not as strong anymore. And this siren, by the way, it's a cool episode, a way to show the boys can be corrupted and controlled, not just by, you know, sex or the typical stuff in this episode, so, but by saliva being an ally to an agent or a hunter that's supposedly helping hunting down this thing as well it's a cool twist on that like one of the birds to get caught by a girl or something million dean but they know this guy this agent he's not real he's a siren bobby looks up the history of this guy he doesn't exist and comes in clutch to always help them and this isn't the first time in this season in the yellow fever episode he always comes in clutch speaking japanese and scaring a ghost away so bobby's always there for them always coming in clutch whenever they need help in a dire situation by the end the boys said they're fine but they're not sam's gonna continue to lie to dean and dean's gonna continue to have an issue with Sam. So episode 16, or it's a really big episode because the angels need help from Dean. They want to use his torture method that he learned in hell. Cassia doesn't want this, but Yurio being the dick that he is, he forces essentially Dean to do this. Sam is left kind of nowhere to run, so he asks Ruby to help, but we also get to see Sam's addiction to this demon blood. Start of it. Turns out he really does need his demon blood in order to feel this presence of feeling powerful, getting off on this need for demon blood. And then that comes during the Chuck episode and later on as well in rehab and whatnot, or just the intervention episode, but the first time that they've shown his addiction and his need redeeming blood just sucking ruby's arm somewhat dry i'm assuming and then also at the same time angels are dying you know dean's torturing alistair this actor playing alistair there's like three different actors that plays alistair but this last one he's great he has a voice that's very distinctive and very annoying it also makes him great because he can't shut up it's a really good actor and voice to have as an annoying demon just kind of mouthing off at you he just kind of spits out being like guess what dean you're the one that broke the first seal the first seal was for a human or just a righteous man to shed blood in hell which is why that crossroads demon 
wanted him to be in hell within that one year, not five to ten years. Not only does Dean feel bad about torturing her, he doesn't want to do it. Now he feels guilty for being the first to break the seal. But there's this dripping water dripping on the devil's trap, which frees Alistair. Castell comes in with his knife, twisting the knife on his arm was really cool, and then having him hooked on the back, exercising the angel out of the human host Jimmy Novak, and then Sam just comes in and slaps him just to show how powerful he's come. Because in the previous episode, he swipes him away, but Alistair can't do it just yet. And then the look on Castell's face, boy has grown quite a bit and crazy we've never seen him this powerful and then we also find out that Yurio is just even more of a dick turns out he doesn't like humanity at all he despises them and wants Cass to join his side to join against Lucifer he wants Lucifer he loved Lucifer how powerful he was just how he worked and how he disobeyed God about humanity Castell fights back Anna comes in to help and then he dies with the whole white blast and angel wings and then the way angels died in the show as well is really cool of the wings flapping out to the side and then Castell reaffirms once again that yes Dean opened the first seal and Dean can't do it he's broken right now he can't suffering from hell learning this thing as well that he broke the first seal he can't handle all of it he needs a breathing time or just wants to run away from it he can't because he needs to finish it and then the boys meet the author of the supernatural books named chuck now what's interesting is that knowing the fact that what he turns out to be later on it's interesting to see him now but as of right now he's just a writer he's writing a story on the supernatural book he gets visions of it just like sam turns out he's a prophet of the lord he was just chosen writing about the supernatural books making money from them and being kind of like a hack writer in a way and this is also the start of the destiny arc for the boys turns out whatever they do whatever they alter it doesn't matter because it's destined to happen it's shown in the laundromat and in the diner place where he wants a sushi burger turns out he's just eating cheeseburger so they can't change it and Zachariah is also introduced well technically last episode and episode 17 it's a terrible life where Sam and Dean are playing different versions of themselves but Zachariah he's more prevalent in the next season but again more of a dip than Durio he is set on following orders and then to end off the episode Chuck has a vision and Zachariah confronts him with it being like you know you probably shouldn't tell people about their future but Chuck is in a tough spot because he wants to kill himself but the angel will just bring him back because he's a prophet and all he needs to do is just write and plus an archangel is watching over him anytime there's a danger to the prophet an archangel will come then season 4 takes a detour give backstory on Castiel but mainly Jimmy Novak the human that he's possessing he was a family man who had a happy life who had a family Castiel just kind of came into his life being like will you accept me and he said yes and the last thing he said to his daughter was I'm not your father and the episode also serves as a way to reform Cass as he had doubt angels just took him so that he can have no doubts or emotions about humanity whatsoever Jimmy Novak and his family are suffering because of Cass he said yes angels and demons want him and essentially kind of ruined his life show like a little smart glimpse he ruined his wife and the little girl named Claire life because they're in fear that angels and demons would you know come to them and just kill them or them as bait for Cass or Jimmy Novak and it's all completely Castiel's fault they were just chilling living life and then Castiel just came and be like do you want to say yes please then by the time we get to the finale turns out angels were never on humanity's side whatsoever they wanted the apocalypse to start so that they can get rid of Lucifer permanently using Michael they just have no care for humanity whatsoever this whole time sure they're righteous and dicks but surely they're on our side because you know they're angels and the history and the bible all that stuff all the preconceived notions of angels they're watching over humans right turns out that is not the case at all they just don't care about them at all they want paradise and their side to win only hell and humanity you know whatever he doesn't really matter to us and it's just a daunting just reality of yeah angels don't care d knows about this and then ruby was never on the boy's side as well she was working under lucifer's order she was the most loyal to lucifer and none of the demons knew that she was even loyal to him except for lilith even alistair didn't know so this whole time even in season three she was working with the boys helping them it was just all a big fat lie same thing with angels they lied about his role in defeating Lilith all a big fat lie Cass being reformed and thinking that maybe humanity is screwed he turns on his own side and sides with the boys because doubts that he has so he does the whole hand sigil thing Lilith is indeed the final seal herself her dying is the final seal so this whole mission of Sam saving humans and then killing Lilith to stop the apocalypse a lie from Ruby and manipulation from both sides both sides are not good at all heaven you would think is good nope hell hell no so essentially by the end of season 4 the only sides that the brothers have are themselves the only have themselves to take care of you can't trust any angels aside from Kaz you can't trust any demon until season 5 comes along Sam allows Ruby to be killed in the water in the chapel there's a white light Lucifer is slowly rising and as he rises it fades to white and that's how season 4 ends So season 4 overall is another really damn good season. The introduction of angels was a cool addition to the show. Them being dicks were hilarious because when you think of angels watching over humanity and being nice and show empathy but no, they're just big old dicks and then finding out that they were never on their side whatsoever. They only really care about paradise on their side and heaven in general and they want to get rid of humans. Maybe not humans but they don't really care about them. Ruby not being on their side was inevitable and the halfway point she was gone for multiple periods of time and showing up having these weird looks so it was a clear signal that she was going to turn on them playing both of the boys 
Cruz. Castiel is a very interesting character, a very powerful character, by the way, who gets disheveled in the later seasons, but very much more powerful than the boys has dealt. Bobby's still there for the boys' side, always being in clutch and dire situations. <laughs> And then the whole brother versus brother thing, it works, but I always felt that that was, it wasn't force. Force is not the right word, but I don't know. It is just not unnecessary. I don't know. I like it, but also don't. Like, I get what they're trying to do because of Michael and Lucifer fighting each other, brother versus brother. I get that, but every time I watch the penultimate episode where they're fighting each other, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but it's still good. The show would just exploit throughout, even after this season, they would just use that. Why not? And it would become a bit annoying in the later seasons to do something else other than brother versus brother. Here, it made sense because it was planned. It was destined to happen. So season four of the show is still really good. So now season five is officially the start of the apocalypse. You start seeing it laid out in this season and seeing it actually happen. So Lucifer rises. However, the boys summon to a plane, which doesn't get explained at all until very later on. And Castiel is dead, totally dead. The angels or Archangel wiped him out. And Zachariah throughout this season, he's one of those characters love to hate. Lucifer needs to find its vessel. It needs acceptance from its human host. So he goes and finds Mark Pellegrino. Nick is his name. And this actor, I've seen him in other things, but his portrayal of Lucifer, I adore. It's really good. And he kind plays a sympathetic kind of a devil part very well throughout the whole season dean is the true vessel and sword of michael however it needs again acceptance he needs to say yes in order to let michael in so zachariah throughout the whole season pressuring dean and damn to an extent just to say yes to michael and then cast comes back turns out there's this looming thing that brought him back it's god claims that it was on his orders or he revived them and brought the boys back and he puts annoying things on the ribs and carved into the bone so that no would be able to find them however not all things are well with sam and dean they still need to patch things up as Sam chose a demon over his own brother and Dean's unable to trust him at this point in time. And also Bobby comes back only to get stabbed and be crippled and Meg also returns. So the opening for the season, a lot of things happen. It's not the greatest thing. It's still good, but a lot of things are set in motion and needs to happen for Meg to come back and Bobby to come in, Cass to rebel and come back and Zacharias and Michael the sword, Lucifer finding its vessel. So the boys, they need to patch some things up, get rid of war first, the first horsemen will show up. They meet Rufus again, Ellen and Joe, but this town being corrupted by a bunch of demons around this town and demons are running around and whatnot. Sam Dean show up, things don't really get better because of war. His rank can change, can make people see other things. Castell, he's looking for God and also he can't heal Bobby, which Castell's powers throughout the show. It's really for convenient use. When they want to use it, they would use it. When they don't, they don't. So it's like, oh uh, yeah, he can't heal him because they want to keep Bobby in a wheelchair so he's not always there for the boys later on he can heal people but then he can't heal bobby like what they get rid of war take his ring they have to part ways and patch some things up so dean is on his own adventure while sam is doing his own thing as well he's going back to that normal life the normal safe life working at a bar there's a girl i fucking him literally wants him while dean is still being a hunter doing the job like he always does whenever sam leaves he's always still hunting Sam wants to be normal dean is having a fun time hunting a archangel named Raphael with castiel they go to strip clubs and that bitch moment but Raphael does reveal that he's tired. The reason why Angel was gone for so long is because they were directionless. They had no direction, no plans. And now there's like, okay, you know what? We'll just do whatever we want. We'll allow the apocalypse to happen. But in doing so, we need to get rid of Lucifer. Sam is dealing with hunters, which by the way, any hunters that isn't the friends of the Winchesters, they're either bad or dumb. I don't know why the show always wrote them like this. There's only one time in season 11 that two hunters were actually good characters. Aside from that, the other hunters, they're just, you know, they're evil. They don't like the Winchesters or they're dumb. Kind of how they are in the show, sadly. Most of them are. Since that he started the apocalypse. Clips. This indicates now most hunters pretty much don't like the Winchester. Now it's even more like narrowed down to themselves because other hunters just don't really like them because they're the cause of the apocalypse. And then just as Sam thinks that he's gonna get out of the life of hunting and whatnot and just kind of figure things out, he's reeled back in because he is Lucifer's true vessel. Michael versus Lucifer, brother versus brother, all of it's lining up just like it did in the penultimate episode of season four. The end, the best what ifs in this show. I think it is. Yeah, it probably is. Dean sees a glimpse into the future and what could possibly be the future if he continues to not say yes to Michael or be apart from Sam, cold-hearted person who's willing to sacrifice his people to get what he wants, but in the end that didn't work out, leaving with multiple women, cast doing orgies now, another hilarious part is him making that phone call, sitting there waiting, and also having Corentone come back, be this virus throughout the world, cool callback to season 2, and then the conversations between past Dean and future Dean was really cool, talking about their deep secrets, and then just the difference in their attitude and tone from 2009 from 2014, just because of what's happened, exact details of what happened in this world, 
world. All we know is that, you know, Sam said yes, and they were apart, and Dean's kind of cold-hearted, and Cassie lost his mojo, and there's really kind of no angel seemingly. So we get a little bit, we don't get the full details on how Crotone infected the world and all that stuff, but it gives a gist of what happened. And then the best part, the last conversation with Sam as Lucifer in a white suit. I really like the fact that this show makes you want to sympathize with the devil, and they try really hard, and it works to an extent. The reason why he was cast down by Michael is because he had this hatred towards humanity. He couldn't bow down to them. They really try to make you sympathize with the devil. And I think that's kind of the whole point. Like, I don't think whether you agree with what he's saying or not, I think the main point of this conversation is the fact that you should feel some sort of sympathy for the devil himself, which is something that's hard to do. And I think this show did it pretty damn well. When I think of the devil, I think of the horns and the yellow eyes and all that stuff, right? It's a very soft-spoken kind of take on Lucifer view or just kind of multiple ninjas of destiny. Doesn't matter what you alter, destined to happen because it's a plan that is playing out. Both Sam and Dean, they have to accept that no matter what. And that will be mentioned throughout in the season. It also turns out to be Zachariah's ruse. Just say yes so that the devil can't win. But Dean still says no because he learned another lesson stick with his brother. Because as long as they're together, it should be fine. They should be able to take down the devil himself. And so both him and Sam being apart for only two episodes and they're back together. Not fully though because throughout the next couple of episodes, it's hard for Dean to trust them. Slowly patch things up so they can face the devil. Bobby is not having a good time in this season. He is in a wheelchair throughout most of the season because of the sacrifice he made for the boys. So in episode 7, he tries to help out the boys on a case about people growing old and growing young backwards. And this is also the episode where Dean gets old and he can't eat burgers anymore. It hits on Chick, but the Chicks just find him adorable because he's so goddamn old. It's here that Bobby confesses that he feels worthless. He feels no need to be alive anymore and wants to commit suicide. Just like he's there for the boys, the boys will be there for them as well, convince him not to commit suicide. There is a way out of this. Hopefully, apocalypse doesn't happen because they only have themselves by this point and so despite feeling hopeless and useless he's still gotta find a way to feel something's worth living for they'll be here for the boys changing channels this episode is still great pokey fun at the tv genre in general is a great concept and even without the trickster the concept itself the boys going around playing different characters in different genres and having fun at that is a great concept within i've got genital herpes <laughs> So it didn't really need that Gabriel twist thing, but turns out the trickster is indeed an archangel named Gabriel. He bailed out of heaven. He didn't want none of his family business. He became a trickster, a god, a semi-god, and the boys find that out. Now, this is a way for Gabriel to run away from family and not confront them because he's tired of them. But eventually, at some point, he's going to have to confront family because family. All the nods. Now, I didn't get all of them, but Knight Rider, obviously, the Knight Rider theme with the Impala. That ad, genital herpes ad, I feel like is a nod to like those medicine commercials, the cop show thing, a bunch of stuff in this episode that makes it great but the main takeaway is the fact that gabriel's running away from family and he's gonna have to face it at some point he's like preaching to sam and dean you know this is your destiny play your roles on the flip side he's not playing his role of facing family a bit hypocritical of him but he eventually does Becky is a character that i don't necessarily mind but also don't love her when she was introduced at the beginning of this season she was fine her weirdly dangerous obsession with sam progresses in episode 9 of a supernatural convention more meta stuff about the show and you know she's fine chuck's back there as well this episode is a little fun episode but it's only noteworthy because she mentions Rowley and the cult. The cult is going to come back and play, but mainly Prowley. I love this character. This character is probably my favorite and the best because knowing how he was treated in his last season, just cherish every moment he has on screen because Mark Shepard as Crowley is great. He pulls a fast one on the boys, killing his own demons, and gives a cult to the boys because he doesn't like Lucifer at all. He believes after he beats and wins, he's going to overthrow demons as well and kill them all. Plans to get rid of him by using the boys to run away. He's a little weasel. He's like a little cocker whatever element he'll survive ellen and joe come back and this episode serve as the boys kind of not willing to accept what is destiny what's destined to happen anytime they try this is the first of many things or many times that they try to break away from destiny and it backfires on them they get ellen and joe killed they have the cult they have an angel they have bobby back at base about radio things they have ellen and joe hunter back up the only hunter seemingly but immediately cast gets taken away and caught in a hellfire or circle thing by meg and lucifer meg shows up with hellhounds one gets into joe really good she has to make the ultimate sacrifice in order the boys to use a cult on lucifer and ellen she volunteers to die with her daughter once a hellhound gets inside it explodes both dying in an explosion losing both probably the two best hunter friends that they've ever had another thing i did not i don't know if this is true or not but around this time the fan base didn't like joe i think why they just kind of were killed off i don't know if that's true or not i've heard a bunch about that i don't know if that's true or not if that's true that's pretty messed up from the fans if that's not true and if it's for story reasons then them dying here makes sense because of the boys 
confidence and not willing to accept destiny. He's one of the five things that can be killed by the cult. Convenient and begs the question maybe Charlie's on his side. Ritual thing is to raise up death because death is the hard horseman to get up. Bobby, Sam, and Dean mourn the deaths of Ellen and Joe. <laughs> After the deaths of Ellen and Joe, the boys need some help. Psychiatric war thing. They're in their hunting purposes. They meet a crazy hunter in there. It's an opportunity for the boys to just vent out and talk about their issues. Dean talks to the Flash's mom from the Flash about how he needs to do this. He needs to fulfill this mission or destiny and this burden that he has to save the whole world and how that's a big task. Way bigger than what his father gave him when he was little. This is the world and the apocalypse and that's too much. Sam, on the other hand, is blaming himself for everything essentially. The death of Ellen and Joe. It's a way for the boys to just vent out their frustrations on destiny and not winning all the time and how they want to win. Ellen and Joe dying is a catalyst to this hopelessness feeling throughout the second. Anytime a glimpse of hope or a chance for help, it gets taken away because of reality just kind of sinks in. Michael gives a chance to talk to Dean in episode 13 where they go back and meet their parents. Chance for both the brothers to talk to their parents and just talk about Sam not understands what John was doing. They always butted head with each other but now this is his chance to be like he's sorry and why he was doing the things he did. He still did the best he could. Anna also comes back but she's been reformed due to Cass since she's not the Anna that we once knew in last season. Won't go but to kill Sam. You get to see a younger version of Jurio and it's here that Michael's the opportunity to get rid of Anna. He has a chance to talk to Dean one on one talking about why this needs to happen and again it makes us sympathize with the Archangel Michael. He doesn't want to do this. He doesn't really want to but he's the most loyal to an absent father just like Dean was. He's doing it because it's an order and it's destiny and just again more mentions of like this is gonna happen whether you like it or not. It's gonna happen at some point just accept it. Talks about how free will is an illusion. Anytime they try to go back in time or prevent their mother from going from that crib 22 I guess now timeline wise 27 years ago it always ends up back at the same mom pinned up to the ceiling fire explosion in the same episode the boys tell her who they are she's already pregnant but again just like michael and lucifer they don't want to do this just like sam and Dean, they don't want to do this but it's a plan that's playing out perfectly it leaves dean just kind of in his kind of questioned kind of era being like well what do i do now if him and sam keep doing different things but keep going back to the same place whenever they kind of venture out do different things they get their friends killed what do they do now they're constantly being told this is destiny the hell do you do Second horseman famine shows up, makes people desire their most hunger just for anything. Food, sex, money, pills, fried foods, anything, hunger. Sam's hunger is demon blood, that comes back into play, that's how he even defeats famine himself. For Castillo, it's Jimmy Novak's burger or red meat sort of obsession and hunger. For Dean, it's nothing. It turns out deep inside, he's truly dead and basically just given up. After talking to Michael and being constantly told what to do about destiny, it's like, why should I even try? Not even worth it, do anything different, it gets people killed, why even try? Even with the inclusion of Cupid that John and Mary Winchester had to get married and have two kids, two boys, and it was a big thing in heaven, a plan that's playing out. And then by the end of the episode, while they're waiting for Sam's intervention with demon blood, getting all the demon blood out, he's crying for help, or at least some sort of hope, because he can't do it, to actually beat the devil and his brother Michael. It's a big, huge task. And both Sam and Dean, they're just smack in the middle of it. They kind of have no say in this whatsoever, so they're just kind of like, help please, in any way, shape, or form, and nothing, just absolutely nothing dark side of the moon i love this episode the way they portray heaven and how it works is awesome going through your best memories is a really cool idea dean's memories were making everyone else around him happy while sam's memories were making himself happy and that comes to a clash when it's supposed to be them against the world and it seems like they just have different interpretations of family taking that brother versus brother thing despite being in heaven despite what work as a team there's still that looming destiny favorite angel of all time zachariah he shows up plans to rip their skins out but they meet ash and pamela apologizes for pamela we're killing her and ash being the smart ass that he is does some tech stuff and angel radio and explains how heaven works they see Cass on tv claiming that they need to find an angel named joshua who talks to god and he comes in clutch saves the boys go to the guardian and tells them what they don't really want to hear is the fact that god wants him to back off he knows everything that's going on but he doesn't care he doesn't think it's his problem or responsibility both the boys are shocked by this they're one last hope finding god castillo's mission and gold was to find god and just like Raphael said it's a useless mission turns out it is useless because because God doesn't care. He just wants to let things be. He already saved them from that plane. But about Castiel, you know, that's all he's gonna do. He just wants to let things be. By the way, hunters killed them. Forgot to mention that, but they wake back up. And that amulet that he got from Dean gives it away to Dean. He's lost all hope. You can tell on his face. He disappears. The one last glimpse of hope is all gone. The thing for Dean too, he really believed in this. He takes that amulet and throws it in the trash. Never to be seen for like five more seasons. Something like that. Really heartbreaking, just gut wrenched for all of the characters. This big hope. God himself, right? Nope. He doesn't care. Do it yourself. Figure it out. It's like, damn, all right.
During the 17th episode, near the end of the episode, Dean goes to Lisa. She comes back and this is a selfish move on his part. He knows after he tells her everything and how he thinks about her and how he sees her, wanting to be in a family with her and Ben, just kind of leaves her wanting more questions because he tells her all these things, it's gonna be alright, he's gonna pay hunters to get them out of here, keep them safe, he's willing just to accept and say yes to Michael. He's willing to just roll over and be like, yes, Lisa's now in panic, worried about Dean now, selfish on Dean's part to kind of do that. Yes, it is a good moment, he now has her all worried and whatnot. The angels, they find a loophole around Dean. Since Dean is so insistent on saying no to Michael, they find a loophole. They revive Adam because of the whole bloodline thing. They can use Adam as Michael's vessel. Not a true vessel, but it's still a bloodline of Winchesters be a replacement for Dean. And this causes a bunch of issues for the brothers and Cass and Bobby. Dean doesn't really want Adam to take a bullet from him. He's insistent on saying yes now more than ever before, but Sam doesn't really want it that way and Cass also doesn't. The whole episode is mainly talking. It's also the 100th episode. They probably weren't planning to have or something celebrated because it was supposed to be a six days at Bobby's place under his little bunker thing talking about just not trusting each other and trying to get Dean's sort of faith and hope back because it was really set on God didn't work he went and talked to Lisa gave her many things to be worried about and now this Adam taking the bullet say yes now and of course Zachariah obviously messes with Adam he eats the burgers drinks the beer makes him cough some blood and whenever they get to that place Castell uses the hand signal on himself blowing away himself and other angels while Sam and Dean get to Zachariah and it's there that Dean finally says yes this whole season is him saying no, saying yes finally, only to be a whole ruse, drinking Zachariah, and to get close to Zachariah to stab him, finally killing him, finally getting rid of this goddamn angel Zachariah because he was just annoying but also amazing and did what he needed to do to be an annoyance to the brother and just to follow the orders and plan. Feel good moment for the boys, a win for them. But sadly, Adam gets trapped, and since he didn't say yes, but he is another vessel of Michael, Michael is gonna go inside. Adam is now Michael. This also convinces Dina not give up hope, not just say yes yes immediately to michael now but that's not a thing no more and this is also a loophole for dean a way for one of the brothers to get out of this destiny stuff so that one of them can have a happy ending so then gabriel finally confronts family after years probably decades hundreds of years of running away from it he finally confronts family in the form of lucifer sam and dean get themselves out of a bunch of demigods lucifer just smacks all of them kills all of them and since gabriel's are in a circumstance that if he doesn't do anything about this he's gonna regret it so he has to confront family pushes lucifer away gives a porno too i think dan he talks to lucifer despite ending horribly talks about how cubans are better than us a lot of them do try and they don't try to be righteous since he taught all the tricks he's been faking out death since season two faked out another death in this episode so eventually at some point death is gonna catch up to him and it finally did killed by one of his brothers but in doing so confronting family even if he dies for it because he needed to he needed to stop running away from family and so his arc from start to finish is done his arc is complete and it's fantastic the only issue is it's not because of a retcon but i'll get to that but but as of right now, he's dead, totally dead, and his arc is complete. And within that part, it's Gabriel himself says that he's totally dead. They need four rings. They can't kill him, but they can put him back in the cage. Now they just need pestilence and death. So pestilence gets like the least amount of screen time, I think. They just kind of, they have him and death being in the same episode, which is kind of weird. I don't know if it's just a running out of time thing, but he's probably the most disgusting one because he gets people sick. Now it comes out. It's actually quite disgusting. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're just like, you know what? Let's make it disgusting for only half an episode because I don't think people will want to watch that. But Sam and Dean, they get from him. Castile comes back and then they introduce death in the most probably perfect way they can. Devil takes hold, have mercy. And this might be the best one. Introducing death, him walking, up to him shouldering him, and then he just swipes and he dies. An amazing way to introduce a new and scary ass character. Actors that they got even look old, so when you see him, it's like, God damn, how old are you? You old ass motherfucker. It's not the fight that you would expect. Dean goes over there, turns out death is kind of cool, you know? He doesn't like being chained to Lucifer, and so instead of fighting Dean, he just gives his ring to him. Unexpected way to go for death, but there's no fight. He just kind of gives the ring to Dean. You better do everything to get Lucifer out and back in the cage. And he means everything everything which means sam saying yes to lucifer because dean is out of the picture he is no longer needed sam is the one that needs to say yes and the only way they even found him is because bobby sold his soul due to crowley again crowley's a goddamn cockroach and little rat just going around helping the boys out but has his own agenda since the world is ending or coming to an end bobby's like you know what fuck it let's do it he sold his soul doesn't trust them but eventually he budges he even takes a photo of the kiss which bobby did not like at all and that's how they find death and he gets bobby to stand up again so he's not worthless no more even though cass could have done that but because he healed adam but then he couldn't heal bobby next to him. Now they have everything they need, the four rings. The only thing that needs to happen now is to say yes to Lucifer.
and finally the end swang song what could have been the end or supposedly the end of the series so this episode was great getting a history on the impala and how important it was to the show and to the boys the only option is for sam to say yes to lucifer that's the only option they take the rings sam says goodbye to bobby and Cass, just in case it might not work he goes up there with dean gets demon blood juice despite lucifer knowing that he has the rings says yes because he thinks he can beat the devil from within turns out he can't lucifer's pretending dean's all alone again sam now has to deal with lucifer having some fun with him telling him that he's been all always watched by Azazel or his high school friend from episode 20 and he's always been watched it's always been destined to happen Dean decides to call Chuck Chuck has his you know dirty deeds and whatnot the final showdown is gonna happen at a cemetery school cemetery in Kansas I think I think Kansas right it's Kansas Michael and Lucifer are there at the cemetery before even fighting they talk it out being like why are we doing this this is one of dad's stupid orders we don't have to do this we could rebel however Michael's very stubborn very much likes to follow order it is funny Lucifer is the one that's like making sense making you feel sympathetic for the devil but they have to fight each other a song comes on and Paula sounds Dean comes up I'm not letting you do this Cass does an ass butt to Michael give him 5 minutes Lucifer snaps Cass goes at Dean Bobby uses a cult snaps his neck he beats Dean more and more until a shine of light this is what gives me the impression that this is supposed to be the end there's a montage clip of the first 5 seasons Eric Kripke's vision of the show that gives him a chance to get out and take control the ring says a bunch of those words there's a hole in the ground there's a cage it is right there Michael comes back and there's only one option for both of them to jump well Sam does but Sam decides to grab Michael and both of them fall down a hole seals shut and then Castiel is back he's back supposedly God brought him back heals Dean heals Bobby and they did the unthinkable they actually beat the devil this whole time constantly being told you're not gonna beat it it's destiny they prevented the apocalypse they prevented what was destined to happen it isn't gonna happen and they finally beat the devil Dean isn't gonna see Bobby for a while Cast is gonna do heaven things he's probably freed but there's one glaring issue Sam isn't there and Dean has an issue with that but it's what he expected and he gave a promise to Sam not to look for him because he wants him to go live a normal safe and happy life that he's always wanted mowing the lawn that's all he wants it's a normal safe life maybe not as exciting as going around hunting monsters but it's safe and you won't get killed and that's what dean wants and that's what sam wants for him so he goes to lisa knocks on his door he has his family they accept him chuck goes away question who he is but he tells the final story and tells us why supernatural is all about family sacrificing john sacrificing for the boy dean making the deal sam sacrificing for dean to prevent the apocalypse all for family and then there's a shot panning out at the house and it faced to black and that's how it ends no nope, totally not a shot of sam standing outside right after i don't know the time frame but right after he gets out somehow sam looks and then that's how it ends season six but am i ending i just want to fade to black and that's not what happened anyways it fades to black and uh yeah that's how season five ends in choice they chose family and well isn't that kind of the whole point so season 5 overall, Eric Kripke's era of Supernatural, him show writing for season 1 through 5, this season's great, it's got everything, tying everything together, all of the previous seasons matter, there's a connective tissue throughout, it makes sense, despite being told it's destiny, there is indeed free will, Castle is a funny, powerful character, which he would be devolved in something, next next seasons, Bobby's a great father figure, him being there for the boys, preventing them, not saying yes, for a good chunk of season 5, but can't really prevent that as well, making Lucifer into a sympathetic character is very ballsy on the writer's part and the show's part but it works to an extent same thing with michael i mean michael isn't the devil but making him feel sympathetic because angels by that point were dicks making angels dicks was hilarious and then hopelessness in the second half as well it was a great build up to them finally actually beating the devil doing the unthinkable doing the impossible and preventing the apocalypse so overall eric Kripke's era or his seasons of supernatural the first five seasons are great So season 5 wasn't the end. Sadly, Sam was a cliffhanger during Swan Song to get renewed for a 6th season. So coming back, there's a 1 year time skip. Dean is living with Lisa and Ben, living the happy safe life that he's always wanted. But in vain of letting go of Sam, he experienced loss during Swan Song. He had to move on from loss. Sam coming back, it's like, well, that entire finale doesn't really mean much. Kind of ruins the finale. But anyways, once Sam comes back into his life, it's like, okay, yeah, Lisa and Ben are just kind of there now. So I'll just talk about Lucy a bit quickly and get them out of the way. I don't necessarily care for them. They're for Dean to be happy. But again, once Sam comes back, they're just kind of there and more of a kind of an annoyance because later on Crowley will just have them be bait. It just would have gone in circles. Sam and Dean hunting while Lucy and Ben gets captured or used as bait or something like that. So it's like, okay, you need to get rid of them somehow. Ben obviously likes Dean. Try to get Dean back with Lisa. It doesn't work. Lisa's already moved on. And she also realizes during an episode, once Sam came back, it's over. He needs to be out there back hunting, doing what he does best. Penultimate episode, it's like, yeah, he's your son. It's like, no, stop it. Nah, there's a lot 
lot of resemblance there, but it's really not. So in order to see being used as bait, he asks Cassa wipe their memories, goes up to the hospital room. They don't remember, they are written off now. I was always confused on why they brought back Samuel out of the Winchester family. I don't know why, I mean he did nothing in the season other than again to betray the boys and be an annoying and create drama, essentially family drama. Aside from that, that's really it. I don't know if they just really like him or something, that could be the case, but for narrative purpose, he served nothing whatsoever. And Sam has been working with him as well for a year, which I mean I guess makes sense because it is family, but in the end he just betrays them. Again, the whole ordeal, why you do something, you're gonna have him be this type of character, ratting on the boys. It's a waste of time to me, bringing him back, though to this day just kind Kind of confused on why they even brought him back so in the first half there's like i think three main players or kind of villainous things going on could maybe just two and a half but monsters and souls they're like a big issue now because carly wants them and he's getting every alpha and the show introduces alphas first of each of the monsters kind get the purgatory and then castile was dealing with an angel civil war Raphael, the angel that he called a bitch he comes back and play he even goes to heaven being like telling his brother and sisters they're all freed they can move on but angels are still set on a plan and order Raphael has that so they're just kind of robotic in a way we need orders we want to follow them and that's really it that's how the angels work on this show they have no mind on their own whatsoever aside from castiel and then i guess with probably as well as meg like this is the start of the season where she starts working with the boy becoming more of an ally to them instead of a villain but she's still a demon she still wants what she wants still gonna betray them in some sort of way she is still there trying to get rid of crowley now i don't particularly have an issue with crowley because mark sharper he's great in it but Raphael, he's an archangel but for some reason i get this feeling that he's not as powerful as gabriel michael or even lucifer like archangel he's supposed to feel powerful but he doesn't feel that at all and so whenever he comes out it's more like oh yeah he just seems like another angel castell scares him off in a way it's like are you an archangel the way they portrayed him and just written him wasn't particularly the best or interesting way and maybe it's because he wanted to go through the plan of the apocalypse maybe but it's just a redo of that because he wants to redo that and then the monster well first of all the only monster in alpha that i really care about is the alpha vamp he is really damn cool the actor that plays him his sound and the look of him fits the part of an old vampire first vampire ever created by his mother eve that was perfect cast on the show's part. I don't know the actor's name, but he is great in the role of just being an old alpha vamp. So something is off about Sam. There's moments in the first half of him not saving Dean. He lets Dean turn into a vampire because he knows there's a cure for it and they need to get close to a vampire nest. And then to get closer to that alpha vamp, Dean obviously notices. He calls Bobby for help, asking maybe how it changed him. And it definitely did change him. And turns out he can also lie. Truth thing in episode six, can't tell the truth. Dean tries it. He gets infected with it. He tries to use it on Sam, but he just lies all the way through. So maybe he has abilities why not like there's a bunch of theories going around i thought it was just like maybe it's lucifer when Dean knocks him out and castell has him and castell touches him turns out he has no soul so he's walking around with no soul whatsoever which means he can't feel a thing at all he can't emote at all so anything that he does he won't feel it and i don't know what that would be like being soulless like how does that actually feel I think what they did on the show makes sense not being able to feel anything and emote anything at all well for sam it's hunting so anybody he kills he's all right with it he's willing to do extra step and just finishing his job that will come back later on and fire him in the ass but like things like that letting his brother get turned even though he knows what will happen he might hurt lisa and ben and all of this stuff but he's willing to let that be in order to get what he wants which is alpha this is probably my favorite sam out of all like different type of sam even demon sam soulless sam is my favorite because he's aggressive terrifying and doesn't care no emoting no feel soulless type of character so apparently they kill off crowley because castiel he burns his bones there's a bobby centric episode where he wants his deal with crowley to be off even cause a son for it but then sam and they find his bones bait him into burning his bones to get rid of him but he lets go bobby of the deal one year deal completely free now alpha monsters in cage the wanna looking for purgatory big vast and probably he wants it for power as well but in this episode meg comes back there's that cool porn bit with castiel of getting a boner and then they're working with meg sam is still solo these two meg's lies laughs at the interrogation that she does but we get to the point where castiel brings it back it's crawley's bone and crawley says that he brought both samuel and sam back up which is a total lie by the way and since he says he can't he burns crawley away and crawley supposedly dies he is dead for sure 100% and then there's also talk of what will happen if they do bring Sam's soul back from hell it is stuck in the cage with Michael and Lucifer so there's gonna be a lot of torture and a lot of memory just trauma to the head it just makes sense for soul of Sam not to want it because he's better this way he isn't scared because to him it'll make him weaker since Dean is desperate he goes and calls for death well first he meets Tessa and then death but this is also the episode where he meets Robert England and it's just it's really cool to see him in a supernatural episode you got Linda Blair in season 2 now Robert England I just thought that it was really 
really cool that they actually had him on the show. But he wants Death to get both Adam and Sam Soul, but one Sam Soul. And he puts a test, a rigged test for Dean so that he could be deaf for one day. Not so easy it is to keep up the natural order of things. And if you go off and do your own thing, there are consequences and other people die for it. And Dean learns that he's willing to kill a robbery, a guy having a heart attack. But once it's a little girl, it's a kid, he can't do it natural order. And it sucks. The natural order in life just sucks. But he's got to do it to keep up the natural order. Sam is busy trying to kill Bobby because he summons Balthazar. This character Balthazar, I feel like he was introduced just to be like a MacGuffin. He knows a spell that can keep a soul out. Like he just has everything. I feel like that's what he was there for. And that's basically it. Sam almost kills Bobby, but Dean comes in. He realizes that it was a rigged game. Dean failed his task. Dev is still gonna go get Sam's soul from hell because both Sam and Dean are to him a natural order in the world. So he's gonna get his soul back. And Sam just screaming no because he wants to feel nothing essentially because he's better this way. Dev gets his soul back in him as he screams and yells in agony. So when it comes back, they introduce a new villain, Mother of All, Eve. She is the creator of all these monsters and she wants it to be ruled by monsters on Earth. Now while I think she's somewhat cool, she's alright, you know, just this girl that seems innocent. Anyone who comes across her, she messes them up, turns them in some way. I guess my only issue is that they cut her off early for a kind of no apparent reason. She died in episode 19 and she only showed up for like 3 episodes I think? Episode 12, 16, and 19, right? Or am I missing some episode? I think that's it. And then another character returns turns from the dead so it's two or three kind of villains alongside in the second half which kind of creates this mess but it works to an extent it's also the episode where they introduce dragons the first of the two dragon episodes which i think are a lot of fun taking virgins because they're pure and they feed off of them being pure or something like that it's a lot of fun and the rock thing the rock bit of dean grabbing the sword pulling the sword from that rock the french mistake this is the episode that every supernatural fan knows about favorite episodes of all time because they're breaking literally breaking the fourth wall of jared and jensen playing sam and dean playing Jared and Jensen. The setup is Balthazar sends them to the fourth wall through a window. They're on set. Their names are Jared, Padalecki, and Jensen Ackles. And we meet his wife. They all make up stories about they actually hate each other even though everybody knows best buddies in real life. Misha, all the tweeting stuff. His actual voice too. You realize how deep his voice has to be when he is playing Castiel. They also portray Misha as kind of this asshole on set pushing away assistant directors or people on set as well. Like stuff like that. And like the acting scene quote unquote where they have to actually act was hilarious. Especially Jared moving around and like saying like there's this lock it's like what the hell are you doing Grace is somewhat of the plot for castiel's army in heaven and his civil war with balthazar and seemingly after he saves balthazar from the whole ring of fire by sam and dean he's actually working with him it progresses that but mainly the episode is jared and jensen playing sam and dean playing jared and jensen and it's hilarious it's funny and it's great they also kill eric kripke which i guess you could say that this imagery and what this is is this is the end sort of his role in the show. i think he wrote season six finale but aside from that he's done he just gets checked because he's still credited as a producer on the show but yeah this is the death of eric kripke and his role on the show so bobby's whole thing this season and what he has to do is lose another friend rufus so it's always been said and just kind of done off and back in rufus and bobby's younger days of hunting they were a team just like sam and dean we only get bits and pieces of it in this episode and despite only showing for like three episodes you could tell rufus and bobby have a history with each other so they meet up with samuel this is their take on and then there were none and there's this warm monster thing that's going inside people's ears it gets inside dean samuel bobby and and Bobby with the monster inside him that has Rufus literally right in his heart killing off Rufus for I guess no reason like I don't know why they kill him off maybe it's for Bobby to progress his kind of depressing route because I don't know Bobby just seemed like this experienced loss and got over it, but it seems to be continuing over and over again and this little warm thing just kind of says that same thing any other villain Eve has plans plans to take over the world her children typical stuff like that but Rufus dying it should progress Bobby's story which is I don't know kind of nothing he is a side character he's not the main character but every once in a while he pops up and does something i guess he just loses another friend because in the next episode the titanic episode he has ellen back ellen and joe are back because of what balthazar does saving the titanic to create 50,000 souls for castiel's army but then he loses her right again and the only person who knows are balthazar castiel and the boy this season he's just going through a lot once again last season in that goddamn wheelchair contemplating suicide this season more suffering for him and then guess who comes back your boy crowley because he is a goddamn cockroach turns out castiel is working with them the burning his bones and everything and 
episode 10 was all just a fake all a lie. He needed Crowley to get out to experiment more on Purgatory and the monsters, but also he made a deal with Castiel so that he could help him defeat Raphael. There's an entire episode, episode 20, dedicated to Castiel explaining why he did what he did. The only issue that I have, well, there's two. One, I don't care. He's the one who saves Sam and gets Sam out of hell, out of the cage, and that's an issue within itself for me because cage supposed to be like this locked door or something. Like, I get it, angels can snatch a soul from hell and from earth, but did he know that he would have no soul or like there's just issues around that. It'd be hard. Michael and Lucifer are there. They just see Castiel snatch him and they're bringing on earth right after the finale of Swan Song. Like also by the time I got the episode 20, I did not care about Soul of Sam no more. Like they didn't need to really explain it. Well, they felt like they needed to, but it was like, okay, you know what? Just kind of forget it. It was just like, okay, we'll just try to explain it. Castiel did it because he needs an army. Probably agreed to make a deal with him to defeat Raphael to prevent the apocalypse 2.0. But then the boys found out that he's working with Crowley and all this stuff. He betrays him in a way, whether to trust him or not. And by the time it was episode 20, I did not care by that point. Castiel decides to do more things that are a bit questionable, breaking Sam's mind in the finale. And a good chunk of that finale is within Sam's own mind, collecting, I guess, all the souls or the things that he's remembered. There's also like this wall that's blocking his memory. So anytime he scratches it, like in episode 13, and he kills one of Bobby's friends as well. And then he also gets betrayed by Crowley and he kills Balthazar and he's just on his rampage of making mistakes. So he decides to do the unthinkable, swallows all of the souls up. And that makes him a god and very much powerful. So he has a chance to kill Raphael, kills him, leaves Crowley because he has plans for him. Now, because the boys did not listen, he told him to stay back and listen to him. Everything will be fine. And they didn't. And now he's going to call himself the new god. And everyone should bow down to him as the last thing of the season. Which came out of nowhere, by the way. Anything after 5, the finale leading up to that, and the final moments of it, comes out of nowhere because there are probably no plans whatsoever. And from a writing standpoint, the show doesn't get renewed until like early February or late January. Somewhere around there, whenever CW renews show. Because it's not like the show got renewed like 15 seasons. It got renewed once. One season every year. From a writing perspective, that's hard because probably like i don't know a good chunk eight episodes left to write and finish somewhere around there they have to be like oh i guess we'll have to wrap those up and set up something else essentially and that's hard on their part so that's why every finale after five final moments just come out of nowhere and profess your love unto me your lord Season 6 overall, I still think is a good season of the show, but clearly with some bigger issues. The new show right now is Sarah Gamble, and she would run the show for this season and next season for only two of the seasons. And she was a producer and writer on the show previously, so she's worked on the show before. But some of her ideas are good, and some of it mostly are good, but I think the way she structured them, and part of that is kind of her fault, but also the writer's fault. But for example, Raphael didn't really need to be there, but I guess because it's a continuation from season 5, it's something for Castiel to do. Lisa and Ben was not particularly the best choice, but again, Again, they were Dean's happy ending, got renewed, so they had to do something with that. Solo Sam was great, and only lasted for the first half. Jensen also directed the episode, you know, Bobby's, I think? I think that's the episode, right? Because he was brilliant in the episode. It's a good start. It wouldn't be his best episode that he's directed. It would actually be in the last season. And then also having three villains in the season felt a bit messy. Crowley in the first half mostly dies and comes back later on. E playing her off kind of early for, I guess, no apparent reason. Or maybe there's a reason. Who knows? Maybe I'm just not seeing it. And then Raphael feels useless. So the villain part of the show in season six dropped immediately. They weren't bad, they were just kind of there, but it's got some really cool filler episodes like the Alien or X-Files Nod episode was really fun. The first dog episode was cool, there's only two dog episodes. You Can't Handle the Truth, Friendship Mistake, that was a lot of fun. Titanic episode was a lot of fun. The Western episode, the way they meet Samuel Colt was a lot of fun as well. Like there's a lot of fun to be had with the season, but the overall plot and narrative is on the weaker side. Season 6 overall is a lot of fun and it's still a good season, but it's got a narrative problem. So after claiming that Castiel is God, his God complex only lasts for like two episodes. And I think because Misha Collins wanted to take time off. Now, I don't know the reason why, but he was gone for like 15 episodes. He clearly wanted to take a break somewhere and they needed to do something about that. So that's why they created the fire thins. They kind of just spread out out of nowhere. And his ordeal of wanting Crowley to be staying alive. Him wanting to be like a main threat to everyone else while he works in the background. But then also on the inside, all these souls are wanting to get out. So there's this really cool like stomach sort of scene. And I'm right Elm Street, I think part three or four all of the souls and faces on Kruger's body. This reminds me of that. The hands come out. The boys, on the other hand, Sam is still dealing with seeing stuff being held. Then he also sees Lucifer. Mark Pellegrino comes back to play Lucifer within Sam's head. Bobby's just chilling there, going along for the ride. Same thing for Dean. Castiel can't contain all of that, so he has to let go. They ask help from Death once again, bringing Death in just to be the expository why Purgatory was created by God to contain the Leviathan's portal thing that he created. And oh yeah, I also forgot, anytime they bring him back, they bargain for food, so whenever he comes in, he always wants something to eat. I just 
kind of a hilarious bit about death in the show. Cass is all good he heals, but Leviathan stick around. And then here's the thing, Misha's evil face. This won't be the first time, but when he does his evil face consumed by the Leviathans, I just can't help but laugh because it's laughable. His evil face or whatnot, not convincing to me. I think it's a bit silly at times for me, but the Leviathans know that this body cannot contain this vessel. So they go in the river and then they just spread out and explode, go into different cities and whatnot while Cass is officially dead. So after the boys and Barbie can't figure out how to kill these Leviathans yet, they go on a break. Sam hangs out or catches up with the old friend who's a monster and Dean's worried that he's gone off the deep end. And so because of that, he kills Amy, even though Sam says, no, do not kill. She's nice. She just wants to kill for her son. And then Dean does the opposite and kills her right in front of her son. And this plot thread will be Carol for like a good chunk. Oh, okay, hold on. For like this episode, four, five, and six, four to five episodes, this is like Dean's secret. It resolves in the most dumb way Sam figures out by episode six because there's imposter syndrome going on. There's two people that look like him or two leviathans and that leviathan bad dean tells him he goes away for one episode and the next episode they just meet each other again so it's like what was the whole point of this dean killing amy served no purpose and they're trying to do brother versus brother thing again which is not gonna work dean just seemed really impulsive killed this amy girl because he thinks sam isn't right in the head it's just a whole thing that doesn't need to be there so Bobby does find a way to not kill them permanently, but stun them. Chopping off the head works, but you just gotta keep it apart. Soap detergents or something like that? Because Jody comes over to Bobby's cabinet. Someone she finds it. They have a kiss thing going on. She was using some kind of soap detergent and it affected the Leviathan under his dungeon or sex dungeon as Kevin calls it later on. They could have found some other like worldly way to do it, but then they're like, you know what? What is a way to stun them so they could help the Winchesters? Let's use soap detergent. It's more like, oh, okay. It's a way to stun them and then chop their heads off dick roman main villain but he doesn't pop up until i think like the fifth episode sixth episode it's also where carly confronts him talking about wanting to be friends or working together but dick does not see it that way he sees carly as a little rat as a cockroach and he will regret saying that to carly because carly is always around he just kind of brushes off demons don't care about them but all he cares about is his plan for him and his kind and what is it just kind of taking over the world you know just that's it really because after five you can't really top the apocalypse any other season after that it's like well it's gonna be a one-off season i guess we'll have them destroy the world in a way it never matches up because it just cannot compete that's kind of the issues with like the later seasons after five but later on there's gonna be i believe a lot of dick jokes like if you thought there was a lot in season four his name is a dick he is a dick he looks like a dick and he has a dick dick roman he is the main villain another dick and then it's that time bobby gets killed he dies dick roman he shoots his pistol and the bullet goes right through his head death's door An episode all about bobby his choice to either leave or stay we finally find out why he didn't want to have a family or start a family with his wife because he didn't want to become a drunk like his father did did. one more time with rufus rufus actually helps him navigates through his own head yelling at john on the phone raising young little sam and dean he's always been their father figure saw them as his own sons sam and dean on the real world they're just outside all stressed out freaking out just waiting for an answer from the doctors while dean confronts dick in the public and because bobby has a choice in choosing to stay and leave he has a reaper coming after him or not coming after him but just telling him hey you gotta choose accept death or just stay left as a big cliffhanger whether you say yes or no because you gotta get fans interested somehow because the season so far is all right both sam and also find out they're gonna have to wait well they don't have to wait because bobby dies it's a big loss for the boys because i remember watching this being like kind of a big loss for the boys their father figure and they're deciding to kill off bobby obviously the boys would be fine after this because they don't need him around still a big loss losing their father figure So the next part I want to talk about is the filler bunch or the filler marathon. I think this season alone has the most filler episodes in a row. I think five and a half. Like 16 is like half filler, half story. Like they're still continuing the plot with Frank and with dick jokes. I don't know what happened. I don't know if they just had to save all the story episodes for like the last chunk of episodes. But filler episodes that are not only not story, but boring. Five episodes in a row is not good. Like they have to babysit a girl in like episode 11 and her father's a hunter. It gets tricked by a bunch of monsters. Well, was actually a good one. A time travel-esque episode. And Jody comes back helping Sam out in the present while Dean has to deal with stuff in the past is aligned with the present with Sam and Jody. Dean gets a girl pregnant. Turns out this girl that he gets pregnant is in a cult which then allows this baby to be grown and kill the father for the ritual to be complete. It's a weird ritual thing. It's alright. It's a really boring episode. An episode all about clowns. Sam's biggest fear. Dean laughs at him. 15. They reunite with the man that they saved from an exorcism back in like season 3 timeline. Turns out he liked being possessed. He wants a demon back but then the demon doesn't want the human host back. 
back it's a whole ordeal doesn't matter and the 16 is the episode where they just do something that's ridiculous in a way leviathans are involved again it turns out this one leviathan he wants to eat this leviathan and claims that they're here to cure cancer you're kidding right i don't believe that for one second exactly that's stupid like it's just a dumb thing to say like i don't know even now rewatch i'm like that is stupid they're trying to play hero but no one believes it for a second it's dumb and then castiel is back after being gone for like 15 episodes straight he's back turns out he did not explode at all his body just kind of was still in a river and then this woman found him i think they married each other because they're clearly together he doesn't remember his memory he has amnesia mick comes back to remind that lucifer thing is brought up back up again throughout the second half lucifer is progressively getting worse and worse making sam not able to sleep so he just keeps running away his story with this one girl doesn't matter mick reminds castiel that he is indeed an angel smites all these demons which by the way he also believes that woman was with just like the novak family but he gets his memory back dean saves his coat it doesn't have the tie it's just all loose now saves sam from lucifer and transfers his memories into his own head so now he's staying there at the crazy war thing while meg watches over him like an angel so just as we get castiel back he goes right back away guess who else is also back bobby himself yes he did not want to let go so he stayed obviously he's attached to the flask that dean is drinking out of and he's been with them this whole damn time since episode 11 he's been moving beers being drinking and there was clearly signs but then it also makes death store episode 10 all that emotional weight feel nothing and it was this very emotional episode and all of that just kind of taken away once he comes back he was away for only eight episodes in the japanese kind of grudge or ring type of episode where sam and dean have to get drunk with garf as well garf is also in the episode tagging along generally like a fun episode of being drunk while also having to hunt this monster it's a really dumb but ridiculous idea that's just a lot of fun and then sam and Dean find out bobby's alive in the next episode some other hunter that they also know and then bobby meets with her he learns how to control things while he's being a ghost and whatnot they don't like the fact he is indeed alive he should have just let go be in heaven drinking looking at some magazines or something like that you know bobby made the decision to stay because of vengeance this season also introduces a new character named charlie she would not only be integral to finding this box or not box but this tablet she will become a prominent side character just like jody and bobby in the later seasons and would become family to the boys as well kind of like this little sister but she works for this high-tech company slowly realizes that she's working for dick broman and leviathan the way she's introduced is walking on sun so wholesome character and then learning about leviathan and then meeting sam and dean and realizing oh yeah this is all true and even at the end of the episode she wants a goodbye forever but that just cannot be the case because she keeps meeting them over and over again but she's a fun character and this episode is also the only fight that bobby has with dick he just pushes him aside and holds him back in order for the boys to get Charlie out of the building. Dick finds out about Charlie working with the boys. But aside from that, like the only fight, which is a bit disappointing, but probably would have gone off the deep end if he actually did fulfill his vengeance. Another character that also gets introduced and will be important later on is the new prophet Kevin. Chuck is no longer a prophet because he's moved on and turned into like white dust or something. But Kevin is not the new prophet. He starts seeing these symbols of the tablet that Dean and Sam have. Castell also wakes up at the same time and he's gone full crazy. He does a hope on my finger joke. Besides that, touch kevin's nose is very playful with the angels very much anger him because he killed a bunch of angels at the beginning of the season pissed off at him for messing up he's also pissed off at him because he's not taking things seriously he doesn't want to fight no more because he believes everything that he touches will always be a mistake and he thinks he's a mistake and then once they get kevin into a safe cabinet translate the tablet in order to defeat all the leviathans they need the blood of a fallen angel the ruler of hell and an alpha which means it's castiel crowley and the alpha vamp looks awesome only shown for like three episodes of the show the angels take him back to his mom but turns out edgar is there big room has kevin so crowley is the mvp of this whole plan because he decides to play both sides dick calls him first earlier in the season called him a cockroach he decides to make a deal with crowley crowley earlier in the season comes back with a beard and it would be a trademark for crowley wearing all black it's really for a bit of a long paper and dick room has a sign it because he's a crossroad demons as well but also the king of hell so after he deals with all that he comes back to the boys he comes a bit late talks about the fake blood because it's crowley you don't know if he's telling the truth or not he tells him about dick roman's plan and how he knows everything he's not an idiot but is this really his blood or not throws it Sam catches it, he goes away. No one knows if it's actually his real blood or not. The Alpha Vamp thinks he could step up to Edgar, but Edgar is much more older, or just the Leviathans in general are much more older than the Alphas, and I think even general. Almost kills him, but the boys save him in the nick of time, gives him his blood, claims that they'll meet each other next time, which is like not until season 12. And then it comes to the final showdown, which is just bringing in Castiel to look and see where's the real dick, because multiple versions of dicks, and then once he finds a real one, there's a fake bone, thinking that Crowley's giving them fake blood, but no, that was a fake out, stabbed dick right 
right in his neck and then there's this aura around him blows all in black and then both Cass and Dean disappear in the end he wins because he's a little rat he's a snake and he's a cockroach again he'll always survive and then Crowley comes in with his demons takes Kevin away always winning he just bit his time you know Meg was right earlier in the season I guess previous two episodes Crowley's just waiting for his opportunity to just strike and be on top again the opportunity was now Dick was in trouble while also using the boys getting rid of Dick having the profit one of the brothers away so he got what he wanted Sam on the other hand is all alone and then Cass and Dean are in purgatory apparently and exploiting Dick sends you to purgatory and the season ends with Dean and Cass well first of all Cass running away from Dean and leaving Dean all alone while in a background we see creatures running around Dean Season 7 overall, I don't think it was as bad as I remembered it because I remember watching it air during that start of the second half, filler after filler, and there would be like two breaks in between. I think after episode 12, there was a break, like a two week break, and then two weeks of episodes of filler, and then another break. It's like, why are there so many breaks and filler in the second half of the season? Like, I don't know what happened. This would also be the last time Sarah Gamble would be the showrunner and she would pass it on. Jeremy Carver would pick up and be the new showrunner from seasons 8 through 11. Things were such a boring villain. Like, at first, they seemed cool, but one Dick Roman and naming him dick roman was intentional but i don't know it just made it into more of a joke and meme i don't think the issue was like screen time because i think dick roman and the leviathans all combined together have the same amount of screen time that crowley has in the next season and crowley is an amazing villain and character one central villain but that doesn't get introduced until episode 5 and then we don't see him until the mid-season finale and it's like i don't know they're not written well or structured well and also taking over the world bobby is a big hit for the show as the boys wouldn't need him past the season but it is still a big hit losing their father figure and truly being on their own after this season the first half also had that dumb killing Amy thing only lasts for like a good handful of episodes and only to be resolved in the next episode. Why even do that brother versus brother thing? They don't need to do it no more, but they still continue to use that after this season. But at least they introduced new characters like Garth, Charlie, and Kevin. Three characters are good side characters who just come back every now and then. So season 7, while it's not a bad season, it's still a mediocre and boring season. In the shuffling man. So season 8 picks up one year later after Dean goes to purgatory, all bloody up, all kind of disheveled and whatnot. And then like, I think four days pass, the whole ritual thing. And he gets a vampire out of purgatory, which indicates, you know, some history with him and this vampire within the year that he was stuck in purgatory. Then they go their separate ways. His name is Benny. I do like Benny. I just wish they would have had him be a more interesting kind of story because the actor is good. And the character itself on humanity side, or not really on their side, but just kind of doesn't want to align himself with either one. I think it's a really interesting take. Sam, for some weird reason, decided to quit hunting and stop looking for Dean. Probably one of the dumbest things that they've done or written because why would Sam stop looking for Dean and give up? Makes no sense. Like, I get it, he wants to live a normal life and everything, but he stopped because her name Amelia and he had a dog. It's really it. It's this whole thing. Amelia herself, she's fine. Like, the whole flashbacks to him living with Amelia is useless because it's just boring. Also, it means that he stopped looking for Kevin and Kevin is now probably doing whatever. He's just hanging out. So, both boys are on the opposite end of the spectrum. Dean is this fighter type person right now. Tricks about purgatory and carries over in the first half aggressive techniques to get people to talk while Sam is the one that he's given up and this creates a brother versus brother thing again because I don't know why they love doing that last season four episodes this season first half and it's like oh god like that Garf episode where they actually physically fight each other because of a ghost coin thing and then the mid-season finale it was one of the most dumb mid-season finale it wasn't needed it was just like why so since Kevin's been with Crowley he gets a haircut and he hasn't been entirely one year creating this bomb demon bomb thing that could kill demons now here's the thing this is only used one other time in the season they just never use this again because I don't know it would have been very helpful demon fight later on but they just never used it for some reason away from Crowley and learns there's another tablet is a demon tablet and claims that on how to close the gates of hell forever banish all demons and this is a big deal they wouldn't start this until the second half but big deal for you know the boys demon were the first thing about the show and closing them forever would be a good way to end the series however once he took over as showrunner because he did work on the show really wanted to end the show but then it just kept getting renewed every year they were kevin to do throughout the whole season while also dealing with crowley just coming up to him this is with his mother but not possessing her i guess in episode two but you know keeping her in this loop getting rid of his girlfriend and his mom by the way is pretty hilarious i mean she's a badass tattoo the whole devil's shop tattoo thing all calm and kevin's all struggling because he part does like needles and she's always there for her son she's a really fun just cool character good mother essentially 
So Crowley, he gets desperate. He gets all other known prophets because of this angel named Alfie. I've heard to Dean earlier about Castiel and how he was a fallen angel and how he wanted to save Cass because he, well, they probably want to torture him, but he isn't giving out info about angels and on how there's an angel tablet. He's one of the prophets because he's desperate, but those are all future prophets that are yet known, I guess. And they even bring up Chuck. If Chuck is a prophet, how can Kevin be a prophet? And it's like, I don't know. Mark Shepard to plan as Crowley. Him being a villain for this season is great. Saving people, hunting things. The family business. He is charismatic. He lets his presence known on screen. Even though he's a villain, you really like him. All of his big lines of wanna, it's all amazing. And I'm glad that they didn't kill him off permanently because that would have been a mistake. Having him come back all around and just kind of be in the show every now and then, popping up, being a cockroach, being like, I wanna make a deal, and then waiting for his right moment to strike. It is smart on his part. Also knows about the closing the gates of hell. There is a reason for him to go after Kevin and the boys. Because the boys they wanna get rid of Crawley forever. Since they've introduced him, they've always wanted to kill him, but he's always helped them with the apocalypse. And now there's the boys channel to get rid of him permanently and while this is probably his chance to get back at the boys which he already did in the season finale but just get like an extra one up and just a w on the boys would make him very much happy he also doesn't underestimate them michael lucifer Raphael, azazel underestimated them because they were human and in the end they would win probably not an idiot you know he's playing things smart he runs away when it is the right time so Castiel is back, shocker, no one expected him to come back, but he shows up within Dean's sort of consciousness, wanting to reach out but couldn't, clearly lies upon how he got out of purgatory, turns out Naomi an angel who's now in charge of heaven, and it will become kind of his guardian angel, control of him, forcing him to take orders, but also can help at the same time, but because he's back, he can help the boys get Kevin out, runs Crowley, Crowley mentions a bunch of different versions of him, and then he shows his angel wings, and he cracks the demon tablet in half, which makes Kevin's task of reading the tablet a lot more harder now, Naomi also reminds everyone a fan of the show how strong Castiel really is he uses him to kill Dean because he loves humanity she uses this opportunity to kill all that out kill Dean multiple times and then in episode 17 when he does confront her about the angel tablet and how he wants to take it to heaven and not to Kevin gets his angel knife out starts beating the shit out of him it's a pretty scary scene a reminder of like oh yeah he's an angel he's way more powerful than the boys he can mess people up somewhere on the show they're just like we'll just use his powers when it's convenient and we'll make him scary whenever we want to most of the time they're just kind of like yeah he's there the mid-season finale again it has to do with benny and how the boys don't like or sam doesn't like benny and show sam hey amelia has moved on so they both do terrible things to each other bad benny is and how bad amelia is crazy hunter who's insane tries to frame him even though he didn't kill or eat a person whatsoever sam's set on benny being an evil vampire but he's not it's this whole ordeal thing it's like no don't care it's dumb make it stop this will be the last time first half as a way to be like all right brother fight over it's like thank god that's why after this after they come Back. He leaves Amelia. Castiel forces the brothers to work together once again. They need his help to find Alfie. Brother versus brother thing. Making each other feel bad because of Amelia and Benny. It's all just kind of dumb. <laughs> So the boys meet their grandfather, Henry Winchester. Time travels into their hotel closet. Seems like he wants to meet John Winchester. Bloodline thing when he travels into like the future or whatever. Finds out that John is dead. Time travel to his grandsons. And there's a different reaction. What the heck the hell are you doing? Secondly, once they find out who he is, Sam is like, oh, let's help him. But Dean's also like, you know, this guy left dad. Just like he left them. But he's a really interesting character because he knows a lot more than a typical hunter. He knows how to tap into his soul and travel into the future. And he's shocked by the fact that the boys don't know this. What level they're on. Turns out they're just hunters. He's a part of this organization the cult but more like you know a book club the men of letters they just keep up and write down supernatural things and being keeps it hidden in a bunker somewhere he laughs at the boys being like they're just hunters he also brings all this demon named abaddon who would become very prevalent in this season and next season but she's a really cool and badass demon that feels like a threat to the boys but the boys give them just kind of the brief history on what happened to john he just kind of left them disappear out of nowhere care for himself learn that his wife was a hunter became hunter himself is this long history of the winchesters and mary's family family side sacrifice and selfish in a way and just on the fly all of that is just kind of going on with Sam and Dean as well with them making sacrifices to each other lying to each other disappearing on each other so there's a lot of parallels to that he plans to go back into the past to fix things but can't do that quite yet because it will mess up past and the present and future there's a bunch of timeline rules going on right now that I don't know about that I don't care to look into because I think probably be an issue fix the issue now in the present Abaddon captures Sam they go meet her Hannah gets like a hole in his stomach or torso shoots a bullet which has a devil's 
Bull's trap bullet in it, which is a neat idea. And again, these things, they never ever use it again till the very end of the show. Trapping Abaddon, they don't know how to kill her because she is a knight of hell, a bunch of different variations of demons, but they can't kill her with a demon knife. They just cut her head off and bury her until they have to use her again. But this is also goodbye for the boys, who Henry, and they give him a key to the bunker. Now this bunker, it's a really cool set. And I thought, oh man, this is gonna be amazing. And while it is amazing, I also had a second thought immediately being like, oh yeah, they clearly built this, save time on production. Anytime there's an outside scene, they have to go and like find it. It takes time to do that. Start the episode and end the episode in the bunker and possibly have bottled episode entirely in the bunker. It's a really cool bunker with a bunch of cool stuff. They like finding things out. There's a sword, there's showers. The whole entire thing is engraved in Okin or whatever. So they don't have to deal with angels or demons coming to them or other people. They can't trace their cost to this bunker. So it's a really cool idea, cool bunker. So the show introduces Metatron, scribe of God, who just wrote things that God said, or rules or whatever, and I like him at first, you know, he seems like an angel that ran away at Cass or Anna or Gabriel, and all he's done this whole time is reading books, he doesn't know anything about Michael, Lucifer being stuck in a cage, Gabriel being killed, Raphael being killed, he doesn't know any of that, until Samini talks to him about it, and then when he left, all the angels didn't know what to do, disagreed with their method on just doing whatever they want, so he just left, he did nothing, it's like he knows that there's an issue going on, then he does nothing about it, because buried, he's scared, Sam is like in the final stages of closing the gates of hell. He starts hearing these really, really not so great hearing things, like airy things. I don't know what's it called, but it's a bad sound. It's like when you hear like a ring in your ear. I don't know if that's good or bad, but Sam has that thing going on. So in order to, you know, help out, he saves Kevin Samadine in his acting or his directing movie were fakes and gutted Castell. That scene of him grabbing that tablet out of his stomach, really cool, really bloody. It was awesome. So these steps on closing the gates of hell, the first step is to bathe in the blood of a hell. Dean's like, all right, I'm going to do it but then sam's like you know what i'll do it and he does it he says the whole language thing his arm starts hurting and the second half starts seeing the sign of him struggling coughing out blood and whatnot it's clearly affecting him in some way the second stage save his soul from hell and then bring it up to heaven this is also where benny makes his sacrifice which again i just wish they would have used him more in a way that was more effective and interesting having him be causing the brothers to fight and then one girl he likes and then only to sacrifice himself by the end like they could have done more interesting things for benny but he makes a sacrifice for dean goes back in purgatory saves sam and bobby finishes it and then it's even worse he's having his headache rings in his ear and then whenever they meet metatron he mentions the fact getting purified doesn't look like he's getting purified at all he looks like he's in pain and agony but all right he's getting purified and then the final step is a cure a demon each of these steps fairly interesting probably read the supernatural book and kill all the people that the boys have saved so he goes after the one guy for wendigo he goes after sarah and then the one cupcake girl in seven and then once sarah dies the boy starts questioning whether they should go through with closing the kids of hell probably gonna continue to kill more people that they've saved he's about to kill jody and it's left as a cliffhanger whether he actually killed her or not kept fans waiting for her return until episode 8 of season 9 but the boys get back at him they handcuff him and use him because they're gonna kill crowley while that's going on metatron is clearly gonna use castiel and betray him abaddon shows up to help crowley supposedly but she shocked by the fact that a salesman like crowley is the king of hell dethrone him and be the queen of hell and then also it gets really interesting and kind of dark sam uses enough of his purified blood to make crowley into more of a human talking about love hbo mac game with thrones and how much he wants to be loved asking for forgiveness and it's really good on Mark Shepard's part, things with him and Sam are all good. Then Castiel and Dean learns of the fact that Metatron is planning to banish all of heaven and angels to earth. Another really good kind of speech and scene from Sam, the reason why he's willing to go through this is because he doesn't want to let his brother down. Bringing back the whole first half, brother versus brother thing, making it into something good. He let him down in the first half and he doesn't want that anymore so he's willing to make this sacrifice in order to do something at least good to the world and make amends to his brother. He's gonna die very close to Crowley, you know, finishing the third and final step, curing a demon. He's still in agony castiel cannot say that because metatron took his grace put him somewhere in the forest and then there's a bunch of sounds and whatnot build up kevin at the bunkers there's a bunch of dots on this big table map thing all the characters look up in the sky angels are falling it's like a meteorite just kind of falling from the sky angels Season 8 overall, having Crowley be the villain was a great choice. The first half of the brother thing and fighting each other, that's all dumb. Damn, quitting is dumb, but all of that is forgiven. Closing the kids of hell, introducing Abaddon, Henry, the bunker, angels falling down. Probably the best finale since the fifth season, honestly. This is up there with that finale. Falling from heaven, it comes out of nowhere. Again, it's another ending where it's like, it comes out of nowhere because why not, you know? And the one big thing that I can praise this season for is the way it's structured. I'm just gonna give credit to Jeremy Carver because he's a showrunner, but the way they structured it, they know how to balance between story and like filler they knew how to balance it out in this season it wasn't like five episodes of filler and then four episodes of story appreciate this season more on rewatch there's not a certain point where the season comes to like a whole so for jeremy carver's first season as showrunner it's pretty good
So Sam is hurt from the trials, obviously he has his own out of body experience just like Dean did back in season 2, which is what the season 9 premiere reminds me of, plays in a hospital, Sam is now in bed, you know he's talking to death, willing to accept death just like Dean did, but Dean again convinces him to be like no, angel named Ezekiel basically possess him because he can't heal him from the inside just yet, Dean's willing to let him possessed by an angel that he trusts at the time because he called to all angels, Castiel isn't an angel no more, his grace is taken and now he's a hobo essentially throughout this first half, it's another angel, any other angel that isn't Castiel is just a bad angel. Cast now has to consider, okay, do I want good clothes, food, or water? But now he knows that like the struggle of what humans go through, taking a shit, peeing, sleeping, and all of these things that he didn't have to worry about before. He now has to worry about being in this camp full of hobos and him standing outside. He wants shelter. This one lady takes him in. He has sex first time, which is a big deal. It turns out she's an angel, but seeing something different from Cast, other than you know just messing things up because of his righteous, not righteous, but like of what he thinks is like the best thing. Maybe it's something that he can't really mess up. And with this angel Ezekiel being inside Sam, every once in a while he pops up letting Dean know how things are and how he's scared of Cass. He's afraid of other angels finding out about him. Sam being Sam and then Ezekiel popping up being like, no, don't do this and that. It creates an interesting sort of play for both of the boys. It does take the stakes out of it being like, yeah, he's gonna be fine. Abaddon rises, gets her old vessel back, thinks that these demons should be in the soldiers by looks and whatnot, beats the boys. Her arc is basically just breaking down Crowley, vice versa to Crowley's arc as well, getting rid of Abaddon, thrown back. She's not really a compelling villain evil demon that's just way more stronger than the typical demon the actress whose name i forgot about persuasive and she's a demon that's an actual threat to the brother since like azazel well i guess lucifer is a demon he's a devil but like before lucifer i guess azazel and then there's this angel named Bartholomew who doesn't really show up. I don't know if this is just like the actor schedule, but he only shows up for like a handful of episodes for Castiel. And it's a way for him to lead an army of angels against Metatron because they are willing to listen to him now. But essentially, he's an evil angel making people just kind of say yes to the angels inside of him. And there's also another angel civil war going on. There's a side of angels that hate. They're on Earth, Abaddon, Crowley, that's hell stuff. On the heaven side, angel versus angel civil war. While Metatron is like the writer essentially of the story because he's meta. And then Castiel eventually meets him and has to kill him because he's willing to just do anything to get back at Metatron and win this war between angels. They need a leader and Castiel seemingly is the one that needs to lead a team against Metatron. So this angel Ezekiel isn't Ezekiel, it's actually Kadriel, a prisoner. When that angel first meets him, he doesn't recognize him. And so because of that, he's easily swayed, planned to rebuild heaven. And angels love plans. He's been with Dean for a while now and Sam safe and Hunt essentially. So he likes Metatron's plan because rebuild heaven. So one of the first big things asks him to do is to kill Kevin Tran because one, he's of his usefulness in reading the tablets and two it would be an issue if he could read it Meta wants to use the angel tablet to his advantage so he's gotta get rid of kevin cast also gets a bit of grace back not his own grace it's some other angel's grace this grace will keep him an angel only for the second half of this season and a little bit in the 10th season fully and officially back yet but kevin's death looking back on it i remember watching it being like this is clearly for shock value metatron's point of view it makes sense to kill the prophet of the lord because it could read the angel tablet and metatron needs it it makes sense but at the time i thought Oh, this is clearly for shock value. He's been useless in this first half. Punch Crowley every now and then in the dungeon. That's basically it. Wanting out of it. The hope of him in season 8 was to finish closing gates of hell. Move on with his life. That's a big old lie. Once he's in, he's in it forever. Those were the best times. Most so Crowley is finally utilized and back from the sex dungeon. They decide they need his help with the whole needle thing they did to Alfie, but now they're doing it to Sam or Gadriel. There's a bunch of shenanigans, talk about why Cass needs a car, talk to the demon and how she's playing both sides just like Crowley did. Metatron has Gadriel kill more angels buddy of his, he did what he needed to do. They capture him, they do the whole needle thing, and it looks really gruesome, disgusting, but awesome at the same time. And then Crowley has the bright idea to go inside Sam, literally. And he goes inside of him, whenever an angel or demon they're possessing a human being, they create like a fake world or in a wall so that the human being can just be like oh yeah this is the real world Kajiro shows up they have a fight going on he slaps Crowley Sam's able to overpower him somehow to get the white essence out while at the same time Abaddon shows up this is my freedom first half he's just been like sitting on the chair so it's time to actually use him now in the second half half the demons are aligned with Abaddon and Crowley and so that creates an interesting kind of like power kind of deal and he just kind of walks off brother split apart for only like two episodes Dean let Angel inside of him and Kevin's death is on their hands so he leaves off leaving Samuel Castell so he can continue healing him 
So then the show introduces the Mark of King. The most interesting thing about this season and the next two seasons, Crowley's comeback to Dean, despite in the last episode saying that he would kill him once they see each other. But Crowley needs an upper hand on Abaddon, and turns out the Mark of Cain can kill a Knight of Hell. So they go meet the third new King from Cain and Abel. Supernatural has this thing where they have a one off character that shows up for like an episode or two, to leave a distinct mark on the show because they're just very memorable. And this Cain character, very memorable. I just remember him distinctively. Given up, he's retired, a demon that killed and whatnot. But then he rebelled, dealt with Abaddon before, killed his lover because Abaddon was inside of her. And then he just kind of disappeared and left. And that was the myth that the demons would know about. Story that was spread around Cain. And now meeting face to face with him, he's just tired essentially. There's a fight within the house and he's just watching Dean. So that kind of attitude and tone about him. And like he just looks cool as well. After the whole fight, he just admires Dean. The fact that they're similar. Probably hilarious. My favorite one liner from. <laughs> Crawley, you're good, but I'm Crawley. Great one-liners. Cast and Sam are healing. Cast wants a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Getting some grease out from Sam. Plot is useless. Dean is willing to give the mark to Dean as long as he's willing to kill Abaddon and then him once he calls for him. The way that it's transferred as well is really cool. It's like this leech or parasite going to Dean's skin, leaving a little mark on it. Crawley just kind of played him. Crawley knew all along about Kane, the mark and everything, but knew that he wasn't able to get it. So he had to use Dean as a way to show Kane, hey, give this mark to Dean, please. The mark only works with the blade at the same time. So the blade is somewhere out there. That whole human blood thing is so affecting him. Throughout this whole season, he's thinking about the blood. He wants love or wants to be loved. He injects himself human blood. Episode 16, full on junkie. Lost his touch or Abba thinks he has. Wants to feel human. Dean finally touches the blade. Meet one of the men of ladders who evil. And he wants to use Dean as his pet because once he touches it, he gets his feeling of aggression. Though touching that blade and that sound, that eerie sound or whatever. Showing how Dean feels at that time. Boys have a conversation on, you know, getting rid of Abaddon. But once Crawley's out of the picture, once he's not useful no more. They want to get rid of him as well. They talk about this in front of Crowley. Crowley pushes him aside, gets the blade, keeps it until they find Abaddon. So Metatron as a villain, I think he works, but my issue with Metatron is that he's too meta. It's meta to a point where it's kind of like eye rolling. In episode 18, this kind of reveals like, hey, I'm meta. I'm writing this story like a god. And there's nothing you can do about it. He uses Gadriel, and this is the start of Gadriel betraying Metatron because he feels that like he's being used as a puppet. And he even brings back Gabriel, Trick Castiello, and whatnot, typewriter, writing like he is a scribe of God, so it makes sense the actor he's playing this role perfectly but again it's almost too meta the meta-ness becomes a bit annoying this season is also the first attempt at the first of the three or i guess two spin-offs called bloodline now i don't think this is a bad spin-off idea basically supernatural but in chicago with a new character but then i think that's also the issue most of the fans they watch supernatural for the boys and so if this would have been supernatural 0.0 and that's kind of the issue with the second one as well cool idea and i think it would have worked but supernatural all over again and like the network cw is all about dare to defy diversity and whatnot and I think it was a bit too supernatural itself and maybe the network was like nah this is like supernatural 2.0 diverse some things I believe at that time most of the fans they didn't really like these ideas I don't think it would have been bad I think it would have been pretty cool but it just would have been supernatural 2.0 and so why would you watch that when you're to have the main show so Arthur Dean brutally kills Abaddon aggresses Dean's kind of muse and a kind of obsession with the mark and how maybe the mark is controlling him he has this itch to kill they use this as a way to face off against the Metatron so Metatron is dressed up like a hobo for some reason writing a story putting his Metatron one time but I'm shocked by the fact that Metatron is is really overpowering Dean. I really thought it would have been like a balance between Dean punching, slicing Metatron every once in a while and Metatron overpowering him. But most of this fight is Metatron overpowering Dean. Castillo then finds the angel tablet all light up and destroys it. Story in writing. Metatron stabs Dean in the heart with the angel blade. Sam's there to carry him out. But because he put knowledge into Castillo on books and movies, Castillo uses that back on him and record angels can believe the fact that Metatron is indeed evil. So instead of killing him, I'm in prison for life. And I do like this idea. Not killing your villain, you probably should be killed. But I do like the fact that they just kind of kept it around just in case i don't know maybe something dark that'll show up or i don't know something like that and then crowley forgot to tell dean one more story about kane and how he wanted to kill himself and he did kill himself the blade which by the way the design of it is pretty cool it's like a teeth thing or what exactly it is it looks pretty cool however kane didn't really quite die yet and so happening to dean as well and to wake up and feel like a demon there's a shot of dean with his eyes opening up with black eyes waking up as a demon as a way to you know not have him die again but also die and then wake up as a demon by this point the boys have died and come back so many times where it's like death doesn't mean crap no more death is like this thing that happens once a season and then everything resolves again
season 9 overall, it's still a good season from Jeremy Carver. I think the big and main issue with me for this season is Metatron. The meta-ness is almost too much. Everything else is super natural stuff. Things that I expect. Dean dying. Sam was about to die last season. It is now Dean's turn this season. Gadriel possessing Sam was clearly going to backfire on the boys as well. Kevin feels useless in the first half and they just kind of killed him off. But it makes sense for Metatron's kind of story and point of view. Seeing they were probably they do some stuff with him in the first half. Having him sit down for the majority of it. And then trying to step up in the second half with the Mark of Kings stuff. And then the Mark of King stuff itself is really interesting. And seeing Dean's progression wanting to kill after he touches it for the first time was really cool. We get a one-off bunker episode with Charlie the Wizard of Oz and Thar. And they end the episodes off in the bunker as a way to save time. That is going to be a typical thing going forward now. Having both Heaven and Hell, Crowley and Abaddon battling for the Throne of Hell. Still a civil war between the angels, both of them running at the same time. And while I don't think the Bloodline spinoff wasn't an entirely bad idea, it just wouldn't work because most people watch it for the boys. So yeah, season 9 is good. Magic that powerful comes at a price. And right now, we don't know what that price is. Season 10 is an interesting season because there's no main villain. The only overall main arc is the Mark of Dean. Aside from that, Dean himself and other characters or series regulars, they get their own small stories contained in a 23 episode season. The first three episodes, Demon Dean, which is still disappointing. Demon Dean was so fun and such an interesting concept that they just kind of give it three episodes. I don't know why, what reason. Maybe it's a 200th episode and maybe they kind of find a way to write around Demon Dean. They should have stuck around this whole Demon Dean stuff in the first half of the season. You got Dean taking karaoke. <laughs> Oh, my love. He banging chicks, hanging out with Crowley, probably still continuing to his whole human, and now he just kind of wants to hang out with Demon Dean, and then Dean gets more annoyed with Crowley and his bossing around, embarrasses Crowley right in front of his demon, and he's like the king of hell, and this is gonna spread around like a rumor, he did absolutely nothing about it, he thought he was his friend, but nope, he's just another demon, Sam is obviously still gonna try to save him, but then there's this other guy, Cole, he wants to get his revenge on Dean, because when he was a young boy, he saw a very young Dean, a very bad CG looking Dean, come and kill his father at night, and he just kept that in his head, he has a family and everything, all the training in the world, but then when he comes face to face with Dean, he gets his ass kicked later on in episode 7. He meets a normal Dean and then just kind of tells him to just kind of lay low. He's not worth saving anymore. And Dean basically does a whole talk no jutsu forgiving route. He does. And then his final appearance, he has a monster within him. This character honestly is useless. It's a small story for Dean to have outside of the three episodes with him and Dean and his mark on his arm being the whole thing. But aside from that, he's here to be Dean Maul story that will only last in three episodes. And then Cass and Hannah are hanging out a lot. Running in heaven, Cass still losing his grace. Sam has Dean all captured, tells him a bunch of hurtful things about things that they've already said before, but in a more direct form, probably helps cast out another form of grace. They finally finish the whole ritual of getting Demon Dean out using purified blood. Demon Dean is gone forever. Since the 200th episode is coming up, Supernatural decided to do a musical special episode. Will group of girls go about Supernatural itself with fan fiction in it? They just have all the references and lines, you edgets, cast out white wings on like the road, homages to the show, the opening title card, every time title card except for four they mention the fact that they haven't even acknowledged adam at all he's still stuck in the cage with lucifer which we'll mention it and then like never bring it up or use it at all the writers themselves even poke fun at the fact that they wrote all of the crap from season six until now sam not saving dean or killing off bobby and leviathan they acknowledge their dumb things that they've wrote during the show and obviously the subtext a big fan thing memories the show pays homage to it and thanks to fans and it also includes a chuck cameo at the end scene just because why not he's there he's alive why is he there where Rena gets introduced and she just so happens to be Crowley's mother and she's basically a horrible person throughout this season she's manipulating him and he's only keeping her alive because family in a way but he acknowledges that she's a straight up evil tries to be evil right in front of his eyes killing like demons in front of him and he just kind of lets it go it's only interesting because of how bad of a mother she is the one that's even worse than him and it does seem like he wants her to change she left when he was really young age she's a witch now but there's something inside of him that still wants her to be a good mother by the end of it evil witch who's willing to do anything and get more power and dean is the one that has to tell him after the whole dean ordeal stuff and him being pushed around and he's being laughed and mocked at in hell his reputation in hell is just slowly deteriorating seeing a mother and son go at each other's throats mainly barina probably takes her out once he finds out after castell sees hannah give her cuban host and vessel to its rightful owner he decides you know what i'll do the same so he goes and meets claire novak the family and little girl back in season four they bring her back he wants to make things right give her her life back but jimmy novak is long gone he exploded when lucifer exploded him back in season five and then her mother also disappeared on her
her as well. She's just kind of left her as well with her grandparents. So she essentially has nobody. And it's mainly Castiel's fault. She's like adopted, I think. Family just kind of took her in, kind of used her. What should they do? They use her to steal and rob. She doesn't realize that because all she wants is a family. Mom left her. Castiel again left her as well. The funny thing is that Castiel calls Sam Dean for this, acting like it's an actual case, but it's not who he just kind of fucked over in life. Sam and Dean are just kind of there in a way. But this is also a good chance for Dean to come back and embrace the more because throughout the first half of the season, there's easiest and Sam sees that, but they just kind of brush it off. But he has these looks touching his mark on his arm. And then this is the moment. Once they meet Claire, Castiel is there as well, helping out, meeting a bunch of bad people. They get in fight with Dean and Dean just kind of goes overboard again. We see like a past or a future. This is weird like glimpse of the future of him killing present day. It's that same image. I don't know what's that all about. Maybe it's like a past thing. Maybe it's a dream. But it got the point across of him embracing the mark or accidentally because of constantly getting hit in the head. Castiel has very good intentions. Claire wants something to do with Castiel at all. He just kind of leaves her in this first part and then later on it's like an official goodbye. Fully embraces him, hugs him, just looks like her father. But she has to part her ways because she wants to do her own thing and Castiel just kind of has to allow that. Let her do her own thing, say her goodbyes until next time. Kane decides to come back after having a bunch of killing sprees. He had the itch to kill again, so he doesn't have the mark or the blade, but he gets like a, you know, good looking knife, kills people. He goes out there like, I think, bloodlines or legacies, something along those lines where even if it's a kid, he's willing to kill them because it's some kind of part of his order or agenda. He has a thing for that, which also means that time for Dean to face him one on one. They have to let a crawl for a bit because they don't fully trust him and he trusts them fully, but again, with the Rowena by his side, telling a bunch of lies. But Kane being back kind of sets up Destiny once again because he says when him and Dean are fighting, he says that his live and his life, but kind of the reverse where Kane started his story with killing his brother. Dean's story ends with him killing everyone else around him. Crowley at first and then Castiel and then Sam. Kind of bringing the whole destiny thing. More like you have this mark, you're destined to kill everyone close to you. Kind of the same thing. He goes on and on about destiny and willing to kill others. Since he talked way too much, Dean is able to cut off one of his hands, allowing Nina to have the final blow. Really tries to convey he doesn't want to do this. He doesn't like embracing the mark because it seems to have a will of its own. But Kane is like, no, he's not going to stop because again, last season, he said sorry to his wife who loved Loved them despite knowing the fact that he was evil, he was a demon, which is why he asked Dean to come kill him, live on with his wife in heaven or hell so they can meet her. And so he kills Cain, and this clearly affects him. It doesn't make him fully embrace the mark, but it does leave a mark on him. At some point, he knows, and Sam knows as well, he's gonna have to kind of embrace the mark again and start killing once again, or have the itch to kill. Then Castiel finally gets his official grace back. After Metatron lies about knowing how to get Dean out of this mark, get his grace, Castiel cuts his grace out, go on an adventure, they go to a diner, Metatron is allergic to something, I don't know. But he's gotta go take his shit, saves Castiel's life while going to the library. Castiel gets his grace back, but Metatron escaped doing angel shenanigans. But he's not an angel no more, so him having that is completely useless. Cast gets his grace back and is really cool angel wing stuff. Which, by the way, they changed the angel wings design fully like angel wings, but now it's like this shaped line thing, which look cool. The change in design is a bit weird. I don't know why they changed it, but it's a change in design. But now Castiel is officially back, which doesn't change a thing because he is still gonna be somewhat useless in this season and next season as well. Charlie is a bit more prevalent in the season three episodes she's here to piece off an evil version of herself and then help sam specifically because again both the brothers they love keeping secrets from each other 10 seasons in and they still keep secrets they want to find this thing called the book of dam and while she's looking for this she gets in trouble there's this family called the stein family it's supernatural's take on like the frankenstein where you can't really kill them with bullets or knives until you basically cut off their heads or continuously stab them both sam and dean are willing to help her at this point dean begs both sam and charlie to get rid of they don't want charlie to die mainly sam lies recruits Serena, Sir and Chain, read the Book of the Dam. Eventually, Sam involves Castiel as well. So we got Charlie and Cass and Rowena all in a room together. Charlie and Rowena arguing about magic or some shit. It gets Charlie out. She goes to a hotel, which is a mistake because the Stein family, they are on her tail. Get there at the motel. She gets all the information out about the Book of the Dam and how to get rid of the mark, but in doing so, dies for it. And so when Sam didn't get there, she's dead in the bathtub. Now, I remember a huge outrage about this because they killed off most favorite or just fan favorite characters or side characters of all time. Agree to an extent this came out of nowhere. It would become a catalyst to Dean fully embracing the mark and killing the whole Stein family, which is awesome by the way. Breaking their necks one up and then shooting that one kid who didn't even want to be in the Stein family. He saw his family as freaks, but still Dean killed him because he's a part of them. Almost kills Castiel. Castiel is just, you know, he's an angel, but and I get Dean has a mark and everything, but man, they really making him look really weak. Charlie's death is a catalyst to that. So again, I agree to an extent, but they didn't kill her off for kind of no reason. They killed her off so that Dean would just embrace the mark once again. Sam also does a bidding for Rowena since he has her all trained up. 
willing to kill Crowley, but that also is a mistake that backfires as Crowley now has these red eyes, fully embracing himself. Now that Dean has finally embraced the mark once again, he goes on a case. The finale starts off like a typical Monster of the Week type episode. Him hunting with some other hunter. This other hunter killed and kills a bunch of these vampires. Dean really knows that he's embracing this mark. He's seen in a mirror, bloody up cast, and that other hunter that died, putting just mirrors and whatnot. Sam gets the email from Charlie about getting rid of the mark and all of the ingredients. Cast asks for Crowley's help about that. Marina apparently doesn't have anyone that she loves, but that's a complete lie. Crowley deals with that. So Dean's only option left is to call for death, and he wants death to kill him, which is possible because again the writers they include some kind of last minute thing they just kind of have to make up things last minute to introduce something but also wrap up the story of that certain season the mark on dean's arm is thing called the darkness being that god and four archangels beat during a very long war he created a lock and a mark gave it to lucifer lucifer got corrupt by it he gave the mark to cain and hell he gave the mark to dean all of this sounds very cool and interesting but again introduced super late in last minute Verena's lover forces her to essentially complete the spell and kill him since Verena is the one creating the spell being someone that she loves it's a boy but but she cast a spell on him so that he wouldn't grow old. She kills him. And then the spell works. It goes up in the sky. This lightning thing. And also, Dev is tired of boys bailing out on him. Sam was willing to accept death, but then Dean got him out of it. He's tired of all of that. He asks for the boys to kill each other, essentially. And Dean's about to almost kill in the cycle of brother versus brother and like them fighting each other and them always dying and coming back. Dev is tired of that. But I think they decided to do something ballsy and kind of regrettable. They killed his death. Dean kills his death. There will be another version of death, but I don't know why they decided to kill him. Again, it feels like German cover one of the show to end and him and like the other writers they just don't know when the show's gonna get renewed or be over it seems like again he's doing things meaning to end it but they're not knowing if the network wants to pick it up or not so maybe killing death was like this big okay we're gonna kill him officially so that death next season doesn't mean anything all limits are off that's my only assumption because why would you kill off this version of death he looks and sounds cool bell gets on dean's arm it unlocks the darkness you know sam thinks it's all fine it's all good they have the impala nothing terrible happened nope right after that lightning strikes on the ground and then this darkness comes out all these holes it forms this darkness barrier and wall being as the impala stuck and now the boys are stuck in the darkness to end off season 10. Season 10 overall, like I said earlier, basically a bunch of small stories contained in a 23 episode season. So we have Dean, Demon Dean for the first three episodes, big main arc is him dealing with the after effects of having the mark, embracing it every once in a while. Sam's arc is saving Dean, and then including Charlie in his whole grand plan of line, and then including everyone else. Cassio's small arc is Claire, clearing things up with her and fixing the Novak family. Her mother dies, Charlie's little small arc is with Barina, and then Barina herself includes herself, everyone else. So I really like that take in this season. Okay, let's just change it up, have a bunch of small stories. We don't have to stretch out things, just have certain characters pop up in other arcs in the season. And I think that's a really smart choice. And I'm surprised they didn't do that. Well, next season doesn't make sense. But like the season after that, I don't know why they didn't do this. It was a different showrunner by the time it was the 12th season. So season 10 overall is a pretty solid season. They're really cool and different structure and telling its story in a bunch of mini arcs. Going into season 11, the darkness seems like this force again, apocalypse redo, essentially is, but kind of a different twist on it because it's not destiny. It is caused by the brothers once again. The first effects of the darkness is this zombie-like apocalypse affects people. It has these black veins. Then two episodes, he meets this lady in a black dress and it is the darkness. She has the mark on her chest. They seem to have this kind of monster person type of love, like beauty and the beast or like the shape of water type kind of relationship. Sam also gets infected by this, but finds a resolution, holy oil, but then also meets a reaper named Billy who is just kind of there to taunt them being like you kill my boss because i'm here to throw you guys out of the universe the original it was funny to just kind of let things kind of happen and then the boys dying and coming back he thought that was fun but because there's no more ruler or whatnot or kind of big boss reapers like herself and any other ones they could just kind of be like all right we're just gonna throw you out the boys are always causing trouble harley also escapes from castiel's bloodthirsty kill goes inside and have like an orgy i think i just remember that part in like the first couple of episodes and then there's teases and minions of the cage in the first couple of episodes teasing the fact that maybe it's damaged because of the arrival of the darkness are they coming back and then castiel's bloodthirsty kill stuff that's taken care of by episode three and then kind of the main entry about the darkness is that everyone is scared of them angels like there's a scene of an angel and demon of them about the fight but then they just kind of put their blades back and then sit down to have a drink talk about their job and heaven and hell it's a really funny scene just seeing and demon and angel talking to each other like a normal human being alarms are going off the darkness and just cut a cool scene that i didn't think that i would see but the show did it just an angel and demon talking to each other drinking but everyone is scared of her even the monsters that the boys hunt they ignore 
technology, getting ready for like big armies, just in case they come face to face with the darkness. The big unknown is what makes the darkness intriguing. By the time we get to episode 6, Metatron does reveal the darkness is God's sister, sacrifice one of his only kin, Amara. So it took 6 episodes, she is a sibling of God, which also means that she's like the most powerful entity. So I like the fact that they kind of kept that for 6 episodes and like seeing the reactions from different supernatural entities and beings just being like, this goddamn darkness is annoying. It's like this big myth and rumor and then whenever it comes up, it's like, oh shit, it's an actual thing. And since Carly has nothing else to do, he decides to kind of bribe this kind of darkness. She starts off as a baby infant, but then as the season goes on, by the time it gets to the mid-season finale, she's all grown up. Carly tries to, you know, be like the nice uncle or father figure. He even read books about how to control daughters and that's all he's worried about. He's not worried about hell or how things are doing or age. All he cares about is controlling the darkness for his selfish needs. But then that backfires because of Dean and this darkness stuff again. I don't know if Jeremy Carver or the writers are trying to go for this whole Beauty and the Beast thing. That's what they're trying to go for because he fully embraced her when he had the mark. That's the only reason why. They never truly explain it, which is good. Make audience think of why they have this connection. But my assumption is that he died with the mark. He became a demon, embraced, and then that causes her to have some kind of liking to him. That's the only way that I kind of make sense of their connection. Now, I want to talk about Baby or the Impala. Dedicate an entire episode on the Impala, all taking place from the point of view of the Impala itself. This is a really cool one off episode. One of the best. So cool to see the perspective of the Impala throughout day and night. How Sam and Dean use it and they clean it. We see two girls driving. And it's just a really awesome way to have an episode that has nothing to do with darkness, but also it does because these different monsters, they mention it as well. The most creative the show's ever been. Creativity and just the awesome idea of it and the concept of it makes for a really awesome episode. And it also gives gives the Impala a character of itself. By this point in the show, already a character itself, the Impala is just as important to the show. And then Lucifer arrives. They actually brought back Lucifer and the same actor. They actually went down in hell. Sam has these visions since episode 2 where it seems like he thinks that these visions are from God. It turns out to be Lucifer. That mid-season finale of them going to hell, seeing the cage in person, all the fires and whatnot, Marina being there as well, helping out was awesome. Sitting there watching that live being like, this shit. I was having goosebumps and shit. The devil eyes talking about God and the other archangels and the darkness and how to defeat the darkness because he was there. But he provides no hope because he's the one that sent those visions to Sam, crack in hell and kind of move his way out using his powers to get to Sam but there were alarms in hell. Now Michael doesn't actually show up because they're gonna get her back. They do mention him while he's out in the corner crying to himself down with his brother in hell. That's how they kind of write it off. So then the spell doesn't work then now Silver has Sam in the cage. He thinks that it's God but no it's him and then he mentions the whole bunk bed stuff and all that stuff and that's a way to end off the first half of the season and also get people excited. And then since Castillo has been basically useless since season 5, and at season 6 until now, defeat Raphael but then he messed up, joined on Crowley's side, next season, wallowing all of those souls in Leviathan, dominant on heaven, and then disappearing, crazy cast, he goes to purgatory, he wanted to be the belt, anything he touched was a mistake, he gets tricked by Metatron, loses his grace, he's a human, gets some of it back but not his own grace, leads an army of angels, loses those army, but then defeats Metatron, season 10, he's losing his grace, he gets grace back, but once he does, he gets beaten by Dean, so, in terms of Castillo and the way that they use him, essentially been useless like even Amara mentions that she doesn't feel like he's even worth killing because he feels useless whenever he goes to meet Metatron realizes that yeah he feels like he's done so many wrong he wants to do something at least good and worthwhile he hasn't really done that since 5 so they use that as a motivation for a cast to say yes to Lucifer once they're in the cage and it turns out that Rowena did work for Lucifer he like went into her dreams on Christmas Carly opened and give got like a Sam Funko Pop while she thinks I like, fall in love with this devil in the end he snaps her neck kills her right in front of Carly and then that cast the rape face again whenever Castilla or Risha Collins plays bad. He did a really goofy looking face and then right before that Rowena and Carly has this really moment of asking why she hates him and he doesn't want to feel weak. She feels that whenever she looks at Carly it's a mistake from her past and she doesn't want to feel weak at all. Sam and Dean they get nowhere. No leads into actually defeating the darkness because Lucifer is Lucifer and he's willing to manipulate his way out of the cage because he's tired of being in cage and he does that. He succeeds. Things that like he's able to defeat the darkness and then going forward in the second half the boys have to deal with not only the darkness but now Lucifer. Lucifer then tries to, you know, be friends with the boys for a couple of episodes, but after a certain point, he's like, nah, screw this. He's tired of having to be their friend here for them. This facade of a face and act that he has to put on, he's tired of it. He's about to kill Sam, but then Cassie will stop But They need him to get back to Dean because he teleported Dean to go get the word of God, a submarine and whatnot during a Nazi. Word of God is a one-time news only. They even react the whole hand sexual thing. He can go back to heaven or somewhere else. Their angel help isn't there no more because they only have their self. Angels and demons, they're on their own thing, but there's this feeling of knowing the fact that Cassie 
Mikio isn't gonna be there and their chance of defeating the darkness isn't there no more leads them into a very dire situation. The only angel or friend that they can trust is now gone. It is at that point of the season where the darkness and Lucifer have to come face to face with each other. But for Sam and Dean, they need to get Castiel back. It starts with Crowley. Lucifer treats him like a dog. He has one of the hands of God, but then Demon blocks it, so it hurts him, but doesn't kill him. Horn of Joshua, another word of God. They all think Rowena's dead, but turns out she's alive. Help with the darkness because she's trying to suck up the Lucifer. That didn't work. And then trying to suck up the darkness, but realizes she is very powerful and doesn't want anything to do with that whatsoever because of a whole spell thing in her leg going up to her neck and then reviving her essentially, which is a good choice because Rowena is. A good character to have around she is evil in a way but she's gonna take a liking into the boys and vice versa they try their hardest to get lucifer out of castiel but the problem is castiel doesn't want to budge without his cooperation they can't get lucifer out and then amara comes in lucifer has a horn of joshua he uses his own power blasts that at the darkness and guess what nothing happens and gets captured by the darkness wants to talk to him about god tortures lucifer until she gets a reply from god and the same thing that everyone's been telling her this whole season this whole season she's been trying to get god to do something say something even Lucifer himself is like, he's not gonna listen. Torture him so that she could get at least some sort of response. And then the episode that confirms the fact that Chuck is indeed God. Back in the season 5 finale, fan theories on whether he was truly a God. Maybe he just wanted to insert himself into the story without anyone realizing it. Turned out to be true. He just wanted to be in the story. He meets with Metatron. Metatron doesn't believe it. And most of this episode is Metatron, Chuck talking. Other side story with Sam and Dean. Like Sam and Dean are the side characters. Dark does virus again. That doesn't matter. Metatron asks about why he created. He was just bored. There are a bunch of questions that Metatron wants to ask about him. He's gonna allow Amara to just kind of take over this universe. There's been other universes versus and other earths that she's destroyed his creations and he's tired of that response to metatron about not really caring and just being disappointed is gut reaching to metatron because he thinks that he was chosen for a grander reason for you know some destiny thing with her turns out he was just the angel closest to that door he wasn't special or anything chuck just kind of creates things and let them happen or has a set plan but wants to see them play out and the metatron's frustration with him is giving up it seems like he just kind of allows things to happen because he's given up on those certain things so giving up hope on this universe just kind of allowing sam and dean to just fix the world while he just kind of sits back and writes it watches him just kind of giving up the bit in at the right time because he doesn't feel that like it's his problem issue that he has and questions that he has and he just kind of brushes them off fixes and he can but he just doesn't care and he's also disappointed by his creations just like he was with his sister destroying his creations whatever he creates it just seems like most of the time creations seem to disappoint him like metatron he is a disappointment i mean he was trying to play god stuff like that and funny enough despite metatron being a disappointment he's the one that maybe encourages or just got into like the right direction of helping out the boys stepping in for the first time in a very long time talks about why humanity is his best creation because they don't ever give up yes some of them disappoint they're bad or messed up but they do a lot of things as well they give they love they dance they do all these things maybe you should you know help out every once in a while and that at least somewhat encourages and to be like all right i guess i'll you know do something about it he even vents out to metatron being like he just gave himself the ability to talk french and you know play guitar or whatnot he can do whatever he wants so their take on chuck and god himself is an interesting one like whenever people think of god having this white light maybe appeared or not who knows maybe i don't know you know maybe he helps every once in a while there's probably different beliefs and interpretation of god does some of these things because of balance and whatnot maybe that's why he truly wants a balance between good and evil because why would he let evil out in the first place but their take on him i think is a really interesting one bunch of reunions sam and dean he reunites kevin with them so he's just kind of hands off being like all right do whatever you want i set up some rules and whatnot maybe you will follow them maybe not but i'm gonna go away to dean specifically he's the one that's always been skeptic about angels and god and whatnot all the way back in season four talking about why there's such a balance why not all good things and to him it just feels like he just kind of left them in a way and he hears all of it he knows all of these things but he just ignores the very hands off to a point to where he did it for so long where he's just kind of gotten used to it and then he eventually meets lucifer they have a cool little talk here and there as well talking about why he banished him and favor by the way and then after they get all their issues out and reunion stuff they get ready and prep for the big battle so the boys they need all the help that they can get so they get crowley back they need his help they need warina's help Cass and lucifer at the same time earlier in the season they haven't created this whole like light thing like kind of like this emp thing kill amara and while it didn't kill her it definitely affected her for the majority of the second half and it's the big battle and this is probably the best pin ultimate episode of the show where you got witches they affect her and then demons start coming in and then angels start coming in crawley goes out lucifer has like a spear and then her and chuck have this talk about wanting to be a family but it seems like they really want to change their ways but a locker 
her away, put the mark on Sam, but she's able to overpower, kill Chuck in a way where Dunn isn't really the sun no more. It's a very orange-like color. All of the darkness will overtake the light, which would be an issue because I think Chuck mentions it where there needs to be a balance between light and dark. They need to coexist. One goes away, then things will just crumble. So in the finale, another kind of basically get rid of a mark. If Chuck is dying, he needs to die as well in order for both of them kind of go away and just have nothing essentially. But then Billy comes in, she gives him more souls, gives a very funny look to Crawley, which never comes back. I thought this look to Crawley and Crawley laughing and smiling would be something, but apparently not. It was all nothing. They're gonna use Dean as a bomb. And then meanwhile, Amara seems to have regret, misses her brother seemingly. Now this seems like a very quick turnaround for the character. She wanted to kill him, taunt him, get rid of him. And then in the finale, in the next episode essentially, she wants to forgive. She would feel lonely. It was a very quick turnaround for the character. And then another thing that's just quickly introduced are the British men of letters who are just, man, I can't wait to talk about them next season. But there's an order from the heart of they need to get rid of American Hunter. So we have this lady, eventually makes her way into the bunker, casts up Castiel, and then shoots Sam in the shoulder while Dean is dealing with the darkness. And they all think that he's done it. But then she like summon Chuck, asks for forgiveness. And I do like this, not defeating and get rid of the darkness because of the whole balance thing. I like that. And it as a prize for Dean realizing that family is important, gives him a gift. And that gift is Mary. Season 11 overall is really damn good. Very similar to season 5, there's a lot of parallels between the two where there's a world ending event so powerful that they need extra help. Even with Lucifer, bringing him back, that episode is amazing. That baby episode was fantastic and creative. And then they also use continuation of like earlier seasons where they're continuing the story despite being a filler episode, they do sprinkle in story so that it doesn't feel fully just straight up filler. Follows episode was clearly inspired by that movie, Infection or Virus or whatever, that follows by like a kiss, Dean sees the darkness. That is clearly inspired by it follows the darkness herself motives wise it makes sense she is up there with the villains and it did seem like german cover intended to be like its last season brought out the big guns lucifer bringing him back for a final battle and this would be his last season as showrunner as the next showrunner would be andrew dab from season 12 through 15 and the last and fourth showrunner seems like german cover wanted it in the series season 8 clearly ending with closing the gates of hell and then this season the darkness related to god lucifer having everyone involved it seemed like a big series finale and and then it just got renewed so they had to do something in the finale to introduce British Men of Letters have Amar's kind of focus and regrets be in complete 180 after the big battle it was very quick and her brother made up kind of went away so season 11 overall is a big step up and very similar to season 5 in terms of stakes and big ending world type stuff <laughs> Season 12 to me, I find the main villain and like the main big arc, or I guess one of the two, is the fact that they go back to human villains. The British Men of Letters, and they suck. They do not work. Motives suck. Why are you here? Sam even questions some they weren't there during the apocalypse and during the darkness. They were just sitting back and watching. They capture Sam, questions him on why he's doing these things and how much he doesn't know. Two, they don't have an interesting sort of like, I don't know, perspective or ideology. Like Gordon works because of his black and white perspective compared to the brothers. The boys find out that there is a great area. The British Men of letters they have that as well but they don't really dive into that they're just like we're british you're americans we do things differently get the job done and that is interesting for a character named mick but i don't know instead they were sued what else is there and basically nothing find out what the american hunters are like and if things don't work out get rid of them and then thirdly after the darkness kind of the same issue five and six had where five was lucifer and michael six most people didn't like it at first because they went from the highest of highest to like somewhat of the lowest lowest and this is the same situation powerful being of all time and then you go to like humans this is going to be kind of like a low key season just kind of chill going back to basics right especially after the darkness but the way they went about it wasn't the best was the most least interesting so amara brought mary back the first question i had was how long is she gonna stick around and how is it gonna be interesting because while it's good that she's back how much of the episode are they gonna dedicate to like the boys catching up with her technology and food and whatnot hairstyles or whatever right and then also what is she gonna add because really add anything in this season and next season by the way like they kind of do nothing with her character at all except for question her place in society society now and make her basically be a part of the British Men of Letters and work with them and whatnot. They give her no character development whatsoever until like season 14 by the way. They just kind of use her as a plot device as a way to boys the vent at her whenever she does something wrong with things that they don't like. Playing about why she joined the British Men of Letters. It's like this kind of high baby getting angry over their mother. Bringing her back was probably a mistake looking back on it because they just did nothing with her for the majority of her run coming back to the show. There's at least the Asa Fox episode which was a really good cat and mouse type episode again where a demon is possessing a bunch of 
of hunters since bunch of hunters they know what to do but then they don't know which one to kill or stop or exercise the demon out of that hunter and then it's also a way for billy to come back into the play being like you're a winchester you're out of the natural order and she's gonna reappear at some point there's also a wasted storyline regarding crawley castell and lucifer first half of the season or maybe the second half the start of it literally could have been buddy cop duo between crawley and castell which was great we had that for one episode and then it was gone immediately i have no idea why they didn't use that to their advantage and have that be a storyline of an angel and a demon hunting down lucifer as he's going around jumping body from body finding its vessel that can sustain his grace and his presence that would have been really cool if something new for both of those characters to do that could be connected someone to the boys but then also be on their own because by this point probably and castiel are serious regulars on the show give them something to do and instead they just kind of throw that away wasted opportunity right there and you also could have rowena coming as well as kind of their help there are two main vessels that lucifer chooses the first guy he doesn't play lucifer that well i think the actor even said that he didn't look at mark pellegrino's work he just kind of did his own thing and it's not the worst thing it's definitely not good he feels very childish like more like a kid playing it the fact that god is in there and he's gonna break his toys mark pellegrino's lucifer earlier season he was a very sympathetic character and then the second one is a president and that was a really cool idea another wasted potential kind of plot maybe a starting point or a jump start to the second half possessing the president of the united states they plan things out and they try to cast him down back into the cage but then what they do in the episode is that he has a kid now there is a baby nephilim he gets a girl pregnant her name is kelly everyone tells her about this help from the british men of letters one specific character named catch keeps saying that they're like the greatest hunters of all time and what they show us is that they just have really cool gadgets that's really it for the episode they go and kill innocent people that don't need to be killed but he gives them this egg and they succeed kelly and cast they get away crowley and rowena they get away but lucifer was inside the president of the united states fbi comes in and then they get captured they've been in trouble with the law or government since season three with hendrickson's so it's cool going back to that as well after returning for its winter break the boys are now in solitary confinement and this episode to me is one of the worst of supernatural because in this episode the boys say that being in solitary confinement was worse than hell <laughs> Bullshit. Why would they even write that? I don't believe that for a second. There's no way that being tortured, all blooded up, are not worse than confinement in a small space. There's no way. I get it. There's some people that are afraid of like claustrophobic, but like after what the boys have been through, probably one of the dumbest writing shit on this show. The boys are easily able to get out of that. They don't kill these FBI agents because they don't want to. And they get Mick and Catch being there being like, you didn't kill them. And then they go back to kill them because they have a different type of mentality of doing things. And then like they made a deal with Billy to kill them for like a second. Probably being in there was way worse than hell. Billy's about to reap them or reap mary castell kills hates this cycle of sacrifice between the winchester so he takes it upon himself to essentially just kill billy and billy told the boys that it would have consequences if they ever kill a reaper or kill billy herself come back later on in season 13 but as of right now this is a way for dina to be mad at cat arguments along the second half but the one thing that gets me that gripes me with the episode being in solitary confinement was worse than hell no i don't believe that for a second And then the show decides to introduce a new type of demon, Princes of Hell, which are the Yellow Eye Demons. So Azazel was one of them, three other versions of them, Dagon, Asmodeus, and then Ramel, I think, second one that we get introduced to. But each of them have their own kind of agendas and powers and characteristics. But the second one that we meet, Ramel, case with Mary casting the boys and another hunter. And what they think is a simple demon kind of case, but turns out to be a very Tarantino episode. And it was directed by Gabriel himself. Clearly love Tarantino and is inspired by him. So this episode has Tarantino all over it, very homage to Tarantino himself this prince just kind of wants to be left alone and serves as a way to explain why or how crawley became the king of hell he just became it out of nowhere during season six romeo just kind of gives the title to crawley because he's retired but once mary has a mission from the british men of letters to go get an item from him they are in trouble crawley tries to do another deal with them but then he just kind of gets thrown down he has michael spear as well probably gave him everything Crowley destroys the spear to get rid of that they use the spear on him the item that mary's trying to go for the british men of letters they want the cult so with mary working with the british men of letters sam's like all right you know what maybe i'll try it out once he does he's forced to basically defend himself the alpha vampire returns and then they bring around the whole cult thing back to the alpha vamp and sam sees this as a good thing because they're getting rid of monsters and maybe working with them maybe not fully but you know every now and then will work out and the only member that's really a good thing about the british men of letters is mick his story and arc is essentially castiel from season four he is in an organization he starts questioning his place in there and the ideologies and the things that they did to him and his friends told him and his friend to kill each other and whoever killed would be a part of the british 
arrangement of letters and that obviously scarred him for life something that he kind of thinks about every now and then but once he hangs out with the boys he meets eileen learning the ways and the gray area disobeying against the lead kill him just as mick was starting to get interesting get rid of him so this bb nephilim plot is clearly way more interesting than british men of letters so throughout the second half kelly has this baby dagon is taking her to like the hospital finds out that she's gonna die birth to this kid because it is satan's baby it's half human and half archangel she calls jack live a normal safe life but that's just not gonna be the case at all whatsoever decides to commit suicide however the baby saves her it needs it to be alive to give birth but kelly thinks otherwise she's very optimistic very positive about this whole experience despite having the devil's baby believe in this kid because when she touches him hand to hand this baby kind of shows him a glimpse into the future and believes that this baby is a hope isn't gonna be like the antichrist or any of that he's gonna help this world he truly believes that by touching kelly the baby giving him some of its power he can kill dagon and she also gets rid of the cult kind of pointless bringing it back and then Kess goes around the world or whatever being kelly's guardian angel so crowley makes a questionable decision and i even think the actor mark shepherd even agrees like why would his character do this he decided to put lucifer back in his original vessel being mark pellegrino which i'm glad he's back but this should have been done with he wanted to put away lucifer back in the cage so that he wouldn't have to deal with him but he didn't want him to go back in the cage quite yet because he wanted to get his sweet revenge on him treating him like a dog back in season 11 mark pellegrino to come back which i'm glad he is but this character was beaten down by amara he's done and then the show decides to find a way to bring him back because you know why not and there are some cool moments between the two like crowley pulling a fast one on him where he thinks he's gonna overthrow crowley but then he clips his wings and beats him down but the eventual goal in end game of this is lucifer getting out and everyone knew that watching this so their scenes was completely useless because everyone watching the show knew that he was gonna get out crowley was gonna get out as well he was gonna get killed supposedly but then get out of the situation as well he's doing the same thing and then going into the finale this is probably one of the worst finales there are deaths in this season purely for shock value castiel dying everyone knows he's gonna come back probably dying was bullshit because the actor did not resign his contract so they had to write him out some way so he made an ultimate sacrifice in killing himself to get rid of lucifer out of the other world because there's like this rip in time thing that the baby creates i get another last minute addition they meet another version of bobby which is cool but they want to trap it in there probably kills himself comes out of nowhere there's no build up to it whatsoever and it also creates an issue of why didn't he use bell that he knew that he could trap somebody in a portal and do the same thing to the boys back when he was a villain he could have done that in season six and eight he knew of this spell he was looking for purgatory right why not have that same spell in order to trap the boys who are an issue to him in those seasons it was just a spell that he just kind of whipped up very lazy very quick or at least he could have said something very funny or very crowley like but instead goodbye boys stab killing off rubina off screen she's all burnt up again she's come back from the dead once she's gonna do it once again and then kelly dying makes sense for to jack out of those four deaths kelly made sense rubina is a bullshit castell is a bullshit crowley's bullshit as well came out of nowhere came out of left field no story narrative reasons whatsoever just kind of did it oh yeah i forgot to mention 10 ultimate episode served as a way to get rid of the british men of letter story no more of them until sadly next season because there's one that sadly survived and lucifer wants to meet his son the way he gets defeated or not defeated but the way he goes into the portal gets stuck in it is mary having these angel knuckle things what are those called anoking on them and she punches him into the portal grabbing her as well in that other world all gray and then both sam and dean have to see probably castiel die and then see their brother go away and then sam finds jack in a corner all scared of one with his new and distinct eyes So clearly, based off of what I've talked about and how clearly frustrated I am with this season, this to me is the worst season of Supernatural. Having human villains work in small doses, but as a full arc season, it doesn't work. And it's very clear that the showrunner Andrew Dabman, the writers, had no faith in it because they had a baby Nephilim introduced like halfway through the season. And that was clearly way more interesting than British Men of Letters. Carly saving Lucifer so he could get his sweet revenge was a dumb decision. Why he would ever do that, he hates him so much. Why not just get rid of him? Mark Pellegrino on the show, which again, I'm not complaining, but he needs to go. He serves no purpose whatsoever anymore but even with the lackluster and just crappy main art of the season there's a few really good filler episodes Dean loses his memory the Hiller episode where Hiller is finally in the show for like five minutes the American Nightmare episode it harkens back to Sam's psychic powers there is this girl who has psychic abilities and because her parents are religious they see her as a devil and then the Lily Slender episode which shows more dick angels there's a few really good filler episodes but again those are filler episodes when your filler episodes become greater than your actual main art that's an issue and there's also a bunch of wasted storyline with Agent Beyonce and Jay-Z President Lucifer honestly could have been the second half so in the end season 12 overall has a bunch of wasted potential dumb decisions and is the worst season of the show going 
going into season 13, I wasn't the most excited because of the crap season that was season 12. The first episode is actually one of the better kind of season openers, introducing Jack, him growing up really fast, seeing Castell as his father, not Lucifer, which makes sense because Cass spent a lot of time with Kelly, having a funeral for Castillo and all the other people that have died. Dean is the one that lost hope, while Sam is the one being optimistic about Ma being alive, Castillo dying, and Jack. Sam sees good in Jack, while Dean doesn't. So it does a lot to establish where everyone is at in their headspace. While Jack is the one in the middle, Lucifer is his true father, but he doesn't really want him. He doesn't know his place yet. Both the boys have to really treat him like a child. And then you got the Prince of Hell, Asmodeus, or Kentucky Fried Chicken guy. He's also kind of the bad influence. The boys are, well, I guess one half of the boys are the good influence, while Asmodeus influences on him, but in a bad way. And then the angels, they want him dead because, you know, they're still dicks in season 13. And so as long as he hangs out with the boys for a long period of time, he should be a good person and not be the devil or anything that Asmodeus wants him to be, which is like raising up monsters, hell. The show then also introduces a new type of area to the whole show because you have hell, heaven, purgatory, big empty or the empty. That's where demons and angels go there to die. They get killed. That's where they go. And then Castell is woken back up by Cass talking to himself. He explains why this place exists. Essentially nothing until God came in and then the darkness. They don't like being bothered. They like being asleep. No angel or demon usually wakes up but whenever they do, there's bound to be questions being like, why am I awake? But then eventually the empty allows him to get out. He's back on earth. He reunites with the boys. He meets Jack. Talk about sleeping and eating and whatnot. But he's back. But then explaining how he comes back through the empty. The empty just wanted him out because they want to go to sleep. Was a cool way to bring a character back. And then a new death arrived. And it's actually a permanent new boss now. And this new person is. So they make up a rule. Clearly just be like any reaper that dies after the actual death. That reaper that dies becomes a new death. And they barely have horse man ring and whatnot. But what's cool about this episode and this kind of reveal is the fact that they show all the books. And all the cases people who are destined to die. So there's a bunch of books on Dean where he's you know supposed to die and whatnot. That's a really cool way of showing and portraying how people die and how destined to happen the natural order Dean feels dead once again mom's missing Cass is dead Crowley's dead he feels lost kind of hopeless in a way so he wants to die but then Billy's like nope you gotta still fight because he has a job to do just more hunting saving the world and since becoming new death Billy just has a new rule of following the natural order and Dean is a part of that natural order so while the boys are dealing with Jack Castillo and new death Billy on the other hand over on the other world Lucifer and Mary are dealing with each other Mary doesn't want to be there you think that Lucifer would kill her but he needs her for a bait to get to Jack but once they're there Angel starts coming in they start flying out of nowhere by the way they just kind of drop in lose very easily defeats them and then michael meets them a really cool looking michael and they have their fight that will destroy the whole world and you know it ends in a relatively underwhelming way it won't be the first time too it will happen later on supposedly this will destroy the whole world now granted the world that mary and lucifer are in it's already destroyed but it's like be the fight that destroyed the whole world there should be i don't know earthquakes or something like that but nope they also introduced their version of kevin tran other world basically serves as a way to bring back dead characters that are fan favorites so kevin is one of them they know all about the rips and times and they need angel grace and so michael rips lucifer's grace out not all of it but most of it which makes him more human now then he's able to escape through the portal and he's back in all world but since he's human he needs extra help but then asking for castiel's help asmodeus capturing them and then escaping from hell and then with castiel stabbing lucifer and killing him it's implied that he's killed but then he comes back all fine so it's like what was the point of him stabbing him if it wasn't gonna do anything it leads to him meeting sister joe who is jensen's wife in real life they use his character as a way to motivate lucifer into stealing her grace but also saving it so that it doesn't kill or get rid of that angel grace so that it can come back and reload like ammo every once in a while he wants him to rule heaven for being the king of heaven that is one of the few drop storylines where i don't know if it's the writer's part or andrew dad was like let's just drop the storyline because we have nowhere to go with it so that's dropped immediately it's like tease exorcist spoof which is a pretty hilarious scene but then joe just kind of leaves him mary's still stuck over there and then after jack leaves he wants to find a way to bring mary back so he goes to a dreamwalker he goes the first one and then he goes to a second one named Kaya, and she wants to use her abilities to find other worlds because they're dreamwalkers dream about other worlds the boys find them they also find kaya as well they want to get to that destination that other world however things happen angels just attack and the boys and jack they're in different parts jack is in the michael world while both sam and dean they're in the bad place and the first half ends off with the boys hearing sounds with the very dinosaur like foot imprinted in the ground it left you wanting more because of that big foot but then they would do nothing with it coming right back from the break the show decides to have their second attempt at a spin-off show called wayward sisters this is a much more better kind of spinoff for the show i like bloodlines and didn't mind it about a group of family monsters in the city of chicago this spinoff has recognizable characters like jody mills donna and then claire as well while i have missouri's niece as a part of that team and then kaya and then alex as well so they were probably of them saving the boys from the other world from the bad place claire is right front and center and she's the one that out of all the characters have a lot of character growth jody mills been there the longest kind of know her story claire's the younger one who still has learning to do she's a good hunter but you can do a lot more with her and the other girls as well the girls eventually get sam and 
getting out of that bad place but with Kara dead but then another version and darker version of Kara comes out of the portal with the spear teasing their show but sadly this show didn't get picked up by the CW probably because they didn't see this going anywhere one of the many reasons as to why Supernatural has been on for 15 seasons is because there's only two main leads there's two series regulars but not in every episode that's a really small cast so when you have six and those are going to be series regulars that's a lot of money on a table and knowing the budget of the show it's not a lot as well so you're gonna have to pay those actors as seasons goes on the CW is known for diversity and dare to defy and while this is very diverse they wanted to be different in terms of the tone of the show as well so bloodlines had the issue of being the same like supernatural and this also had the same issue where it's essentially supernatural but with a different cast and they want a supernatural spin off at least different that's why i think it didn't get picked up <laughs> So this is the part of the video, a bunch of dead characters are back. Let me name them off. First one, Rarina. She was bound to come back, she's a witch. But with the purpose being killed by Lucifer, he showed his true face and her and Sam have seen Lucifer's true face. That scares them. Doesn't like the feeling of being scared and being fearful and doesn't want to feel weak. Charlie, I'm alright with this one. I mean, her death was a catalyst to Dean embracing the mark back in season 10. Backlash of fans wanting her. I get it, sure. Don't really mind that one. In the other world, that's how they get her back. Do the same. Third character, Ked. Why did they bring him back? So apparently, how they explain him being back is he had that same spell thing that Rowena had back in season 11 how she came back alive Lucifer killed her for the first time lied about him being like a half brother that doesn't work but no one likes him does anyone really like him character himself the way he's written and his history with the boys no just don't bring him back but they brought him back because why not and then he works with like Asmodea and then he doesn't want to work with him no more betrays him so he just betrays everyone he's not really with the British men of letters no more so it's like he's on his own as a rogue kind of agent but I don't care about him him coming back makes no sense Gabriel now I wouldn't have an issue with this but the big main issue I have is the fact that they wreck on his death so apparently back in hammer of the gods season 5 great episode right his death and his angel wings on the ground was a fake and he indeed faked his own death his arc completed in season 5 so retconning this moment plot in season 5 meaningless because we watch it and you know he's gonna be back in season 13 eight seasons later it's like why this was clearly done for fan service and while i like fan service i want fan service that makes sense this doesn't make any goddamn sense they just retconned it. what they do with him afterwards as well is dumb they make a whole episode about him being a part of a group of gods and how those those guys betrayed him and he wants to get revenge on them and he doesn't have his grace anymore because Asmodea stole some grace from him so he's not fully powered up and then he finds out about the whole very limited amount of angels which by the way they dropped that story as well 10 angels on earth and all the souls the billions of souls are gonna drop from heaven that's dropped they brought him back for fan service nothing else and that was stupid it ruins that great moment in season 5 and his whole arc was confronting family even if he dies by the end that was his whole thing his whole arc retconning that means that he did not truly confront family he did it in a fake they ran away from family and then i just want to mention ruby natural just because it's a fun animated bit and episode within this season them hanging out with the scooby gang was a lot of fun castell getting out the fruit of life getting ingredients for the borders or whatnot and castell come in as well hanging out with Scooby doo and like the whole runny bit with the theme song was hilarious as well it's just a really fun episode and it's also an animated tv show or tv episode that goes longer than the typical animated show granted there's also some natural stuff here and there with cast coming in the bunker the beginning scene it looked good for the budget of the show and they put it off really well and then round two of michael versus lucifer he wants to feel like this new type of person but no he's still the devil he still hates humanity he kills his girl named maggie jack doesn't like that he hasn't changed screams at him grace with the archangel blade which by the way this archangel blade looks cool but it's definitely like why did you introduce this it looks like a MacGuffin blade which then forces dean to say yes to other mark which is an issue because how could this michael know of the whole michael and dean stuff sam and dean didn't exist in his world like how would he know that but then he just does he knows it for some reason saying yes that whole season five concept they know to michael kind of undoes all that as well not really this is a different type of michael but again immediately saying yes and then this michael knowing it and how does he know it is a big issue but whatever right we get to the fight jack is about to kill himself commit suicide he thinks sam for everything right and then michael dean and then this guy didn't fight okay it is one of the most lackluster and laughable wire work fights ever they start jumping and shit and the second fight their own world sam and dean's world where they the apocalypse this fight it was supposed to cause the apocalypse and what happens nothing essentially a chair flip a table flips that's really it and so it it really makes season 5. This season and its retcon makes season 5 feel less of a season thinking about it because this was supposed to cause the apocalypse and it didn't. Dean Michael able to kill Lucifer with the Archangel Blade but then obviously Michael was like guess what? 
season 13 is a very frustrating season where I think I would have liked it and wouldn't have minded it if it wasn't for the Gabriel retcon and like the whole apocalypse Michael and Lucifer fight. One at the very beginning and one at the end in the finale and both very underwhelming and disappointing. And this was the fight that was supposed to create the apocalypse and it didn't and it looked really stupid and dumb. Everything from that question of nature versus nurture. In nature, he's the devil's son but being nurtured by the Winchesters make him a great kind of human being and powerful one as well who doesn't know how to deal with his abilities just yet. Introducing the Big Empty was a really cool concept that sadly they don't really utilize. It sucks that Wayward's sister didn't get picked up but it probably wasn't a thing that CW didn't really want to see kind of go anywhere. There's a lot of fun episodes. Ruby Natural, the heist episode, another western, a new death and how it works. A lot of cool things, a lot of disappointing and frustrating things as well like Missouri coming back and then dying kind of off screen. Bringing characters back that don't need to be brought back. Like you could argue Charlie doesn't need to come back but Gabriel does not need to come back. Catch definitely. Why they brought him back? I don't know maybe Andrew Dab likes him or something. I don't know. Having Lucifer still in the show was a huge mistake. He should have been gone and kept in the cage last season but now that he's here again it's that same thing of like it's cool seeing Mark Pellegrino you know, play this character because he's great at it but him being there it makes him less of a villain and more kind of like just another character. He isn't a threat no more. It's a season where I'm really conflicted because I really like a majority of it up until Gabriel shows up and once he shows up it kind of goes downhill. The last chunk of episodes is where the season shits the bed. Retcons and fan service is just all allowed. Season 13 overall still a season that I'm conflicted with I think due to its retcons and portrayal of the apocalypse with the Michael and Lucifer fight in both rounds I think it's an alright season. I don't want to say it is all of that build up basically leading to like just fan service. <laughs> So going into season 14, the big main arc and story is Michael and Dean. It only lasts for two episodes, an episode shorter than Demon Dean. I don't know why Andrew Dapp or the writers are like, hey, let's have it last for like two episodes and then have it part of Michael's grand plan, his long game, which is good on their part, but it's also like two episodes. I guess they just like small arcs, move on to the next arc, kind of like how they did with season 10, but Andrew Dapp has taken it over as showrunner. He would have a little arc, drop it, and then have it come back later on. This version of Dean and Michael, they could have done something with this, and instead, they only have it for two episodes, experiment on monsters so that they could become angelic monsters because there's no angels left he could build that another army and take over Jensen's doorway kind of portrayal of him is fine not as fun as Demon Dean he was singing karaoke and whatnot but this will also be kind of the first signs of not knowing how to use him and then dropping it having to come back and then dropping it again and then having to come back one last time only to get killed Jack in the first half of the season is basically useless since his grace has been taken he learns how to be a hunter and he actually is a really good hunter in episode 3 he feels like a burden he saves this other girl's life that's what makes him a good hunter but then he starts cuffing and blood he needs grace or else his body is gonna give up and shut down they dedicate two episodes to help find a way to save jack really like horny montage of like sam breaking an axe then having drinks but the ultimate solution is lily sunder she comes back but is not very old and she basically asks them to get jack's soul use that as a source keep him alive as long as he doesn't use it for his powers and burn it out jack should be fine and they also introduce this item or thing or just on how humans go to heaven or earth lily sunder at first goes to hell but then they find a way to hurt in some way and then because she gives her life to jack she's doing something good and making a sacrifice so she goes to heaven but basically Jack is useless up until he gets his grace back since the backdoor pilot for wayward sisters did not get picked up they decided to bring back the Kaya character with the spear and the whole hood and whatnot in front of her about the spear because this spear can hurt Michael so he goes to her he gets all messed up but the boy convinces her to give up her spear so that they can use it against Michael and then they also get catch involved about this egg thing that they knew for Lucifer back in season 12 leading up to the mid-season finale in order to get rid of him but the character herself it's basically an edgier version or dark version of Kaya but she has this really cool like spear thing whenever she she cuts off vampire's heads. It looks really cool. She is a badass. She's able to stand on her own. And since Jody's there, sees his dark version of Kaya, calls Claire and the other girls about this stuff. Probably doing Wayward Sisters off screen. So Michael played the long game with Dean and the boys and Jack and Castiel. Apparently, he didn't leave Dean on purpose to create another army. They actually bring back Garth. Sees through Garth because he drinks a bit of his grace. But because they have grace within all these armies and monsters, he could see all their secrets and their calls. And Michael knows exactly what the plans are from the boys. So they have the spear and the egg. Michael destroys the egg and then once they get to the place knock out Gar for a while. They have this walk montage for no reason and then this other actress playing Michael she actually plays a really good Michael. It's a bit like Dean but just different. Dean gets there and gets the spear. Possession by look transfers back into Dean. Breaks the spear. Two items of weapons that could defeat is gone. Michael has Dean right back where he wants him inside of him. Beating him. Playing the long game and then having the snap like Thanos. I do like this. Michael's long game and long plan. Letting him loose. Dean start having these migraines and just kind of looks of kind of shaky. It was completely random. Good thing about 
start of season 14, Michael's grand plan. Only good thing about Michael, because right after this, they come back from the break and he gets defeated right after. And it's just like, hey, why are they doing this? Having Michael a few episodes or just one episode and then defeating him in the next or him leaving? Like, have him actually be around, but they didn't do that. Michael has things stuck at the corner of his own mind with Pamela. It's just cool seeing Pamela back without her burning eyes. They do reference that back, but he's working on a case in his bar. Cass and Sam had to go back, get him out of that happy place. Having Michael stuck in his head again, they lock him up. It's a cool idea of him being the cage. And then Billy shows up being like, guess what? You know all those books? Shelves of people dying? Natural order? Turns out there's one book, all of them in one certain death, building this box. He lock himself up, thrown at the bottom of the ocean. But that would never come to fruition because Dean gets smashed on his head. Michael get out. He possesses Marina and then Jack burns up the rest of his soul to defeat Michael and then swallow his grace. Him stepping up and not being useless. Why bring Michael back? Why would they even use Michael if they know that they weren't going to use him properly in a way or just be interesting? The way that they use Michael in the season was worthless. It was just kind of like, all right, he shows up, he gets defeated, he shows up, he gets defeated, he shows up again, dies in the same episode in a failure episode. That was how they use Michael in the season. The 300th episode is coming up in the season. They have John come back. Winchester centric family episode. They have this pearl thing that makes Dean wish what he truly wants and he wants John back and the family all together back. It's a tearjerker episode, especially that scene with John and Sam about regrets about not having a moment with them. Instead, Sam's final moments with John was arguing with them. And essentially, John does the same scene three times in a row. He does it with Mary, family all together. They have the same scene over and over again. The whole budget went to probably him because this episode was mainly in the bunker and just talking scene. All of that money went to Jeffrey Morgan. Especially Especially at the time where he's Negan on Walking Dead. So the boys get what they want. One last dinner. All well and alive. But there's a caveat to this. The timeline starts changing. Sam no longer becomes a hunter. He's like a professor. And a really weird man bun. Zachariah is not dead. And then Castiel they were formed. And he doesn't have this love for humanity. So while the family's all happy. He has to go away at some point. They their goodbyes. Crying for one last time. So John has to go away. And everything's back to normal. Back in 2003. John is sleeping in the Impala. Getting called from Dean. Thinking that he had a really weird dream. While Castiel just comes in and ruins everything. No I'm just kidding. But like he comes in, the boys and Mary are like, well, guess we're back in the regular timeline. But it was a very much smaller scaled anniversary and celebration for the 300th episode. The 200th episode was commemorating and homaging the whole show. This celebration and milestone was all about the Winchesters being a love letter to the fans of having John back, hanging out for one last time. Since Jack killed Michael, he had to burn all of his soul. He's just a bit better and interesting. Dean takes him on Don and tells to talk about how to deal with being soulless and how everything just kind of seems to exist. Not to the same effect as Sam because Donatello isn't a hunter. Donatello is more of a, you know, calm, soulless kind of person. Because Jack is a Nephilim, big responsibility of having to care a lot about things. So one of the first things he does is kill this snake. Castiel sees this and he doesn't tell Sam or Dean it's a way to have them fight later on. Kills Nick and then Mary's there trying to calm him down. He has his headaches and whatnot because he doesn't know where to go in terms of using his powers. He has really no direction to go in the moment he kind of yells at mary and kills her which by the way after her death her growth and development could have been used back in season 12 and 13 they decided to wait until season 14 episode 18 to have character development and growth for mary for some reason her character is useless and her dying this way i didn't really feel anything it's a way for sam and dean react in different ways and all of this was caused by nick nick shouldn't even be alive right now for some reason again it's mainly because they want mark pellegrino to stay on the show and he's great he's an amazing actor i like him a lot but he doesn't need to be on the show apparently he didn't not die after that archangel blade dabbed him it killed lucifer but it didn't kill nick that doesn't make any slick of sense but he's alive find his killer the reason why lucifer chose him and they kind of wreck on his whole story demon named abrax whatever his name is he's killing other humans he cries and wills his way waking up from the empty and i was like no does that need to come back and luckily it's just a tease because jack is able to stop lucifer and he almost kills sam with a goddamn rock useless character anytime he's on screen they just want him on the show because they know fans like him again i like him as well but he doesn't need to be there so with jack creating havoc on the world and him telling the whole world to stop lying creates chaos that's when chuck steps in hopefully this season ends strong within the screen time that chuck has they turn god evil in order for him to be the villain of the show and while that's a cool idea that's a great concept okay the way they change who he was all the way back in season 11 or even like the fifth season their version of god before this retcon or whatever he liked the thought of free will but then for some reason whenever sam and dean does not listen to him in the season 14 finale he doesn't like that and then he kills jack right in front of them and then creates the apocalypse a very contained apocalypse by the way I like the idea of him being the villain, the writer being the villain, right? But the way they went through and rushed it was so horribly done. And then he also introduces this really dumb goalizer gun. It's a stupid MacGuffin item. Castile being the one that fully supports Jack, and then Dean being the one that's against.
Lance Jack and then Sam's on that's in the middle I like all of that but again the way they turn around Chuck within like 20 minutes or whatever 180 his character to be a villain was done real fast and then we start seeing like the woman in white Bloody Mary the clown guy whatever right and this is all cool seeing all these ghosts come back they've been erased from existence but because it's God he can bring anything back and so the season ends with this really cool image ganging up on the boys in Castillo and monsters and ghosts coming back from the dead it ends on a cool way but it's also very frustrating to know how it got here Season 14, while having some good moments here and there, overall is really boring. Having Michael leave Dean for the second episode, coming back in the mid-season finale and then getting defeated in the mid-season premiere, and then coming back in a filler episode and getting killed by Jack. A wasted opportunity. Nick being alive is bullshit. He shouldn't even be alive, but he's back because they probably want Mark Pellegrino on the show. And while I like him, he doesn't need to be there. He's there to waste screen time and wreck on his story. Jack was useless throughout most of the season up until he kills Michael and the him being soulless was fun. It will also lead into a whole truck thing and killing Mary and then Sam being in the middle equalizer was dumb Chuck being evil within the finale because why not him being the villain for the last season is a cool idea but how we got there was super rushed laid out somewhere earlier this season clearly just kind of made up on the spot and then there's probably other drop storylines in this season that I'm forgetting about season 14 overall is a season filled with retcons the famous final scene So the very last season of the show opens up a small mini arc with a contained apocalypse. This apocalypse that God started or Chuck started only lasts for three episodes and it has Ketch in it, Rowena in it, Jack the Ripper, a demon possessing Jack. Could have been like a roadmap for the first half at least. The apocalypse, God started it, this half that as the first half. But no, we're just gonna do it for three episodes. We've got work to do thing, which is a nice touch, but like wasn't needed. They've killed Ketch off. Finally, this goddamn character was just not a good character. Why they even brought him back in 13? Still a mystery. Still confused by that. Rowena making the ultimate sacrifice closed the hole that god opened up and fulfilling that destiny that sam was avenging the killer coming back around back from 13 that demon inside jack's dead body turns out it's evil overthrow hell they get rid of the body and then they also bring back kevin which they don't explain the best way at all the worst way to explain it because they have no other reason other than oh yeah chuck lied he didn't see me to heaven in season 11 he sent me down to hell despite seeing him going up in heaven they were just like oh we're gonna retcon that as well so more retcon it's a decent way to start off the last season not the most ideal they had a romance of the apocalypse 3.0 or 2.0 which is disappointing but it starts off decent while the boys are dealing with apocalypse chuck needs help apparently that bullet now he has this pain in the shoulder he created it didn't realize it could probably hurt him they're both like budging their shoulders and he goes to ask for amara's help she's like getting massages relaxing living the life and it is funny that the darkness is now kind of like the light he's going into like the darkness i just find that a bit funny he wants nothing for him he's always been the same old brother just kind of messing with toys and then throwing them away amara wants nothing to do with that doesn't help him and then the second person he asks is Becky. I was like, oh no, hold on. Not this character. But they actually redeem her a bit. She has a husband, she has kids now. She doesn't have this dangerous obsession with Sam. She's not like a writer. And she doesn't know the fact that Chuck is God. So she just knows him as Chuck. She's the one that convinces him to write about Sam and Dean. To get more creative, a new story. He can't handle criticism. Acknowledging the fact that season 7 wasn't the best. Which isn't the worst season anymore. It's actually 12 now. But then what's also funny is that he snaps her husband and kids away. Kind of like Thanos snaps. So Chuck's new story plays out. The boys are on a hunt. And they actually meet Lilith. He brings like Lilith back. Whenever this girl dies who's actually Lilith it was an effective use of like shock because she dies going backwards into like this deer antler stuff and it's a hunt about vampires two brothers marrying Sam and Dean and then when she gets back up it's like a oh what the heck okay this is his new story I guess she brought him back to get rid of the equalizer because Andrew Jab like that's a dumb idea a dumb MacGuffin item Sam also having visions himself being a demon being Lucifer the cold cool way to acknowledge the whole show's history as well and then up to this point which is episode 5 they think okay they're free they stop the contained apocalypse they're out of you know Chuck's leashes but turns out he wants them back because they're his favorite tv show he likes watching them so they're back into a story and it's a really good hopeless feeling just like back in season five where they think they're out but then they're destined to be part of chuck's story they also bring eileen back probably because the way that they killed her off in season 12 was just kind of random so i do like her being back establishing that relationship that her and sam had so because of chuck's contained apocalypse he's able to let michael out adam and michael talking to each other and the way they do and betray them talking to each other was really cool acknowledging like hey he was in the cage just holding him time for like 10 years we have not seen him but now that they have him the fact that Dean and Sam, they do acknowledge the fact that they're sorry, they messed up, they did absolutely nothing with them. So it's just kind of funny being like, hey, we're sorry from the writers and the show to be like, we forgot about you. Maybe the writers and showrunners are like, you know what? We're not gonna do with that. That's a whole new thing. It will cost too much, whatever. And then the fans, they just keep bringing up like, hey, go get Adam, you know, just he's in a cage. It's also a way for Castle to use his powers randomly, catch up Michael on what's happened in the past 10 years, and then he just kind of goes away. And then in the same scene, he able to open a rift and portal with the handcuffs on, begs the question, are these cuffs even useful? They just 
just show him just like snapping cuffs are on him so the cuffs don't work so that was weird After its break, Chuck finally convinces Sam to give up hope, which in then gets rid of both their bullets. Both Sam and Chuck have this bullet ingrained in their shoulders, and Chuck realizes, you know what? Give Sam no hope. Show him different alterations of the boys dying, Bodhi and Bobby killing the boys, being hunters, or other alterations that I'm forgetting about. The whole point of it for Sam to lose hope, so that whenever Dean and Cass get back from Purgatory is another issue. Season six was all about probably getting to Purgatory, finding Purgatory, which is really hard. And then now it's like Michael snaps his fingers and opens a portal into Purgatory. I guess those earlier seasons of struggle really don't be much now. It's a way for Dean to apologize to Cass. Cass still has a fight to get like the seed of her fruit or whatever and we don't get to see that. Would've liked to see a fight but apparently we don't get that. And so once they create this bomb to defeat Chuck, it doesn't work because Sam doesn't believe in his plan and he gives up hope which it then gets rid of the bullet for a way to get a win over the boys. He's written this story so he should really know everything that's going on but he's probably gonna zip up at some point. And then plot armor is like a little arc in the show where Chuck takes away their plot armor so Dean has cavities after eating a bunch of candy. The Impala can't drive their amount of mind the car breaks down so it's a fun episode out of all the side characters garf actually gets an ending we see his family we see him that he's happy and seeing him helping the brothers one last time he's the only character who gets like a proper goodbye for the show stuff like you know lock picking they're hunters they should know these things but that they don't know how to that part was weird garf is able to help say that there's this place that gives you good luck so then they go to that place the boys they need to win a game of pool to win their luck back but then it turns into a hero story where they need to save and be heroes for the other people that need their luck back and so despite losing in the end makes them heroes they're all let go cool concept a thing that was in the background of the show going in bars playing pools or whatnot and actually using that homage to show was a really good idea and just concept and probably the only one as well cast is on his own doing hunter cases which is funny because whenever he's all alone by himself he's doing really good things and you know helping people but then whenever he's like with the boys he's just kind of useless he helps out the mother and her son and then finds jack billy was there to help jack get out of the empty has a plan for him to be this big vacuum bomb but jack still has no soul and so they need to resolve that they need to find three of life something like that either way that gets his soul back he remembers all the pain that he remembers for being soulless killing his mom saying sorry to sam and dean not being able to look at them in the eyes but it's also a weird episode because they bring back ruby and a flashback to meet sister joe this was clearly fan service which again fan service could be good and bad this is a all right kind of fan service this fan service of having ruby and sister joe the wives of both jared and jensen i'm fine with it doesn't matter meg being in the empty randomly but hey whatever right she's there both ruby and joe being some kind of deal to do something honestly i don't remember and it doesn't matter it doesn't feel consequential to the plot and this episode would be the last episode for a long time and would go on another really long break because the whole world at the time would be shutting down After its long break they actually start off with three more filler episodes which is not a really good look but 14 15 16 they were probably filler episode during its normal runtime but they're okay amara's back amara's willing to help the boys because she hears out dean and then is also willing to talk to chuck about saving humanity chuck is annoyed by it because the writers want him to be evil while the boys get jack to eat this bone or whatever to get really strong and basically explode right in front of chuck but the issue with that is i don't know if the writers forgot there needs to be light and dark however this whole thing is chuck's plan it's his story being written him talking to Amar and then consuming Amar so that his eyes are both light and dark and then having Jack eat that bone from Adam and Eve I think is it Adam and Eve I forgot having Jack die again which is like third time I think that he's died something like that and then we also learned that Billy has an agenda of her own she wants to basically erase everything and use Jack as a vacuum so that she can create the world on her own the natural order and balance in place where Chuck is just kind of bending into his will the boys again smack in the middle of it trying to convince one or the other to join their side and do their bidding but the boys won't budge they even get rid of death the empty also gets involved so a drop throw line of castell making a deal back from last season in order to save jack they bring that up in order for him to say i love you to dean and then getting consumed by the empty in front of dean and then that line i love you that feels like bait from the show so this is whole thing of like cast and dean being lovers from the fans it's always been fan fiction and it's always something that i've never believed in of shipping characters that don't really need to be shipped but because supernatural and the writers and the showrunners they know the fan and they themselves acknowledge their fans making fan function of them being meta this moment felt like baiting just being like hey we're not gonna like fully commit to Cass and dean but we're just gonna bait it hopefully satisfied with it by the end no one was really satisfied the people watching it not interacting with the crazy fan fiction stuff they were like okay that was weird while the fans that wanted to see this happen were disappointed i always saw their bond as a brotherly love not as an actual couple so castiel's final appearance on the show is him saying i love you so in the boys final attempts in defeating chuck they bait him into believing that there's no hope in defeating him because jack in the back 
background is basically a vacuum sucking up nature to basically overtake there is a funny bit of a dog where there's like a glimpse of hope dean actually likes his dog and then chuck shows up snaps it and it, it disappears which i thought was hilarious inspiration from endgame where everyone's gone except for the boys and jack they bring back michael and lucifer for some reason there needs to be one more dumb decision Pellerino's back the favorite son calls michael like a puck or something it's a way for michael to be pissed and betray the boys which makes sense in a way i think his betrayal to the boys would win over chuck but then chuck kills michael beats up the boys and then they start laughing jack is there to basically take over his role as god and he does which was a running theory by fans jack would be able to take over as the new god this was very much expected and then instead of getting rid of him permanently live to experience old age and experience his creations of being human and feeling weak and also really like the run on empty montage going into the last episode somewhat excited because chuck had been defeated jack was god as okay world and rules that he's gonna set and turns out plot armor is off the boys still have their bunker they have their dog they can still hunt but within this hunt dean dies honestly i would have preferred both the boys dying while fighting overpowered by monsters but either way dean is the one that gets the nail in his back each to sam it was like half okay and weird and half good whenever he starts mentioning about him standing outside of his door at the pilot and how he was so afraid to actually bring him back and be part of his family again it makes sense because as a new god he's just setting rules up so that things will just happen naturally and just in the way that it's supposed to be so the boys literally they have no more plot armor they can live their life they're finally free from chuck and this is the consequences of that chuck is no longer writing the story wanting his boys to be alive but now the boys they no longer need to be alive because their story is about to end and dying during a hunt makes sense maybe the nail thing yeah sure but still die hunting sam gives him a hunter's funeral burns up leaves the bunker and he gets to go live his normal safe life he has a son now names him dean there's a lady in that background which i'm assuming would have been eileen but because the actor they don't want to come back quarantine for like two weeks or something to shoot five seconds of a scene probably don't want to do that so it's just this lady blurry in the background but he has a wife he has a kid probably teaches him about hunting he has like the mark or whatever devil's trap so he dies of old age while dean is waiting for him in heaven he plays on carry on my word with son driving the impala the makeup for sam's like old age though hilariously horrible it was so bad the vampires with masks they didn't have enough money on fangs which is why they just had him wear masks and then eventually sam shows up in heaven dean sees bobby there as well probably was gonna be like cameo galore in that scene of dean meeting everyone ellen joe rufus but because of the restrictions gonna get that and then they both reunite in heaven standing on this bridge the shot padding out and then the very last shot is really good thoughts are with sam and dean or jared and jensen thank you the fan the last shot of the whole cousin crew as the final shot of the series was a nice touch and a cool way to end the series this isn't the most ideal way of an ending i do like this ending it's not the best way they could have ended it probably the most divisive ending because some fans liked it they didn't like it i'm in the middle where it makes sense after what the boys have been through them dying multiple times and then having a new god of jack just letting things play out and the natural order it makes sense and to die on a hunt and then one of them go live their normal life and then finally catch up to him in heaven that's all i really wanted because they've been through a lot the way it ended made sense and felt right so i like the ending Season 15 overall, the road to getting to that series finale wasn't the best. Most of the episodes I liked, they were decent, but then there's also episodes like The Last Call, which is a horrible episode all about just Dean singing. Jack God was something that I was expecting and was a running theory throughout this last season, so him taking over as that new role made sense. Chuck as a villain, he's alright. He feels like a childish adult, which doesn't seem very godlike. I mean, granted, he's like the creator of everything and the writer, but it's also like, I don't know, man. The way he was portrayed as a villain felt very childish and wasn't really the best villain. There's still some dumb things like that in speech half of it was really not that great but then half of it was good bringing back lucifer in episode 19 just for the hell of it why that was dumb use of michael i was fine with i wish he was in the season a lot more bringing back lilith and then killing her by michael that was also stupid the whole i love you thing didn't really mind that i know it was a big outrage that's always been a whole fan fiction fan thing so don't really care for that jack was essentially used in the later half because he was barely in the first half back in the second half gets his soul back because a ticking time bomb take over the role of god dies two times explodes comes back vacuums himself they use him as a plot device he's not really a character no more billy herself she's an alright death why they ever killed off that original death still really confused by that there probably should have been more homages to the show like that pool episode about them being heroes that was a really good example aside from that i think of any but in the end season 15 the very last season of supernatural it's in that same boat where season 13 where i like it if i would 100% say it's good or 100% say okay but i like it it's good kind of Son, cry no more. 
So with 15 seasons, Supernatural overall is still a really good show. There are 10 seasons of the show that I think are really good and are really solid. The other five, which are season 7, 12, 13, 14, 15. 13, I'm still really conflicted on. 7 is pretty much boring. 14 is okay. 15 is good, kind of. There was a moment in the show, more specifically after season 5 where it did not need to continue. They kept reusing the same old tricks and storylines of the boys lying to each other and tricking each other and fighting each other. There would be no rhyme or reason as to why the boys would need to lie to each other or keep secrets from each other. And any show that goes past even the 5th season just has an issue of reusing things. Having a longer show that will on itself have plot holes probably and drop storyline because it's been on for so long on the air. And then yeah, I think that's it. That's all I have to say about Supernatural and my final, I guess, retrospective and a way to celebrate my 1 year anniversary and to see if I've improved or not just being on YouTube making videos. Hopefully I did. Hopefully you guys see the change from my very first video of that horrible retrospective all the way back on September 5th. Despite its divisive ending, I'm glad I stuck with the show and saw the brothers end because now I do miss the week to week coming back on a Tuesday or Wednesdays or I think they've been on every day of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Then it was a way for me to move on and carry on. So that's it for me. This has been The Road So Far and thank you for watching.